Okay, I'd like to open up a hearing for 7 o'clock uh, request uh, by Jane Latz and Douglas Thayer for special permit for a substantial improvement to the Watershed Protection District for 45 Spring Street, Florence, map ID 22B-58. Uh, we have a presentation. Brief. Brief, that's fine. Good evening. Uh, uh, Roger Cooney, Wright Builders. Uh, we're on, here on behalf of uh, the Thayer family. Uh, this is a, a property that they own in Florence. They currently live in West Hampton. Uh, their intention is to put an addition on the existing single family uh, and, and relocate uh, from West Hampton to, to the property here on uh, 45 Spring Street. Uh, part of the submission had, had shows the floor plan. Uh, it essentially is a addition for uh, mudroom and uh, family room on the first floor and accommodating uh, a couple bedrooms and a full bath on the second. The structure will be built on uh, sauna tubes. Uh, it's in the floodplain and so it will be built on uh, sauna tubes and to keep it above the floodplain. Uh, we were before the uh, Conservation Commission earlier tonight and uh, just informally from me to you, they, they approve um, so that with no conditions, so that'll be coming forward. Um, and so, uh, as far as uh, other uh, impact of the property, no new curb cuts, uh, existing conditions will remain the same. Uh, there's no uh, additional contribution to traffic or uh, vehicle trips uh, there. Yeah. Questions from anybody? Pretty straightforward. But... All the time for the public. Is anyone here to from the public who has questions on this particular project? You raise your hand. It's pretty clean, very straightforward. There's, there's not, I mean, the Conscom was the only issue. We didn't see it. It's not even our issue. Uh, but they didn't object to it, and, and uh, I don't have any issues with it. I'm not going to lie, but I don't have any more time. Yeah. Yeah. No. I move to the record. Approve the request by Jane Black and Douglas Thayer for special permit for substantial improvement in the watershed protection issue. For 45 Spring Street, Florence, map ID 22D-58. Second. Thank you. Thank you.
city was also exploring the acquisition, um, the joint acquisition of Florence Fields. And so there was a lot of confusion about whether or not the zoning would impact and benefit the city one way or the other relative to that project. Um, so I think there was some misdirected or misunderstanding about the reason for the zoning. And this is a perfect example of why the board originally took up the concept is because we have so many other checks in place to address the issues that weren't in place in the 70s when this watershed protection special permit criteria first was instituted. So it's sort of been on the back burner to think about bringing back um, the special permit change uh, and reintroduce it to council. And it, and it can be done because planning board voted it as, uh, positively on a recommendation back to city council so it can be recycled now that um, the uh, other aspects of um, issues that uh, have an impact on us have sort of settled down and we know what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, so, oh, well, since you guys aren't uh, dealing with any other zoning changes, we could bring it forward right away or yeah. um, put that sort of in the hopper. Right. How often do you think it And not that regularly, but of course every time there's an application that comes forward, we'll find it, oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there, there are strips in the city um, along the rivers and stream corridors, uh, large stream, stream corridors, where there are these older homes that have existed forever, so um, it will come up occasionally as those houses are mm -hmm. under So we don't have any permits for any uh, we don't, but you might have a continuation of the um, Connecticut River Greenway project because the stormwater permit hasn't been issued for that. So you can't close on that one. So it could be that in two weeks you can take that up again. But um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely have it. Right. We'll have other things that we can talk about. Would you feel compelled to have another public meeting to see if we read that correctly, that it was just a confusion about the issue, or do you think there are? concerns that we need to think about. I, mean, I think it was pretty clear that there would be two issues were conflated and um, and so particularly given that we have two more permits now that have come forward to the board since that was um, didn't pass, those can be sort of more recent examples for city council to un to gauge, you know, what this really means to the situation. Yeah, I think on our it was pretty clear, maybe on the city council side, that they need to explain further the circumstances behind it or whatever, but I don't think that'll change our position. What else? Four minutes. <laughs> Does that talk start yet? Um, just an announcement next week. The CPC will be holding a public hearing on the projects for this round of funding. So if anybody's interested that those those applications are in and we're going to start talking about them. It's a big list. It is a big list. Um, also, just for the fun of it, just to talk, the Transportation and Parking Commission is uh, fixing to take up a uh, the rules for the electric car parking places okay. in town. <laughs> what are the rules? Well, that's, that's what we have to talk about. How, yeah. how, how long does somebody get to stay there? What is the, you know, will we eventually charge for it? What, you know, just what are the parameters of that? It's a whole new topic. Yeah.
to open up the next year in 4, 715, a request by New Harmony Properties LLC for site plan approval to construct 16,000 plus square foot two-story mixed commercial and associated site development at Village Hill Road, Northampton, map ID 38A-107. Um, just to note, the uh, site engineer on this project is Berkshire Design Group from Northampton. Uh, my company is involved in a project currently with Berkshire Design. We have no contractual relationship, we just are coexisting on the same project. I don't see it as being a conflict, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Um, and that's it, we're good to go. Jonathan is going to be doing the presentation. Okay, I'm Jonathan Wright from Wright Builders, and uh, Meg and I are the principals of New Harmony Properties. Um, thanks for having us. I'm going to try to make sure I do this right. Let's go folder to view five. It might be faster, well, we have a new newer computer, but it might be faster if you drag and drop down the desktop, but you can start this way, and if it's really slow, do you want some help with that? I'm 107 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you look marvelous. <laughs> this is a watch. <laughs> much for, uh, for having us here tonight. Um, really pleased to have an opportunity to present to you the first commercial development on the North Campus at Village Hill. It's been a long time coming, two years for me in, in the pipeline. Um, and we hope that you will see that through this building and our efforts to develop it and, and uh, find the appropriate tenants for it and conceive of it and plan it, that we are setting a standard for what we hope will be a uh, rigorous and expanding business nucleus at Village Hill. Uh, my goal in this is to introduce a handsome uh, piece of architecture, uh, efficient site planning, handsome site design, high performance, uh, well beyond stretch code, a building envelope in a mixed-use multi-story building, uh, which I think if you have reviewed the things before you, it's not an easy task. I'm very, very pleased that uh, able after two years to bring this to you to take a look. Very pleased to have attracted the development support and interest of the Opal Real Estate Group from Springfield and through their efforts and mine to have uh, an important business tenant 
secured for this property that makes it feasible. A major local employer, Fazzy Associates, will be locating here. Uh, you probably read about that in the press, but I think that's a real, a real home run for the city. Um, it's 42 employees. It's a internationally recognized firm, and I'm just delighted that with Opal's help, uh, we've been able to you know, find a home for them. We've gone great to great lengths to make provisions in this proposal for the future development of the adjoining property, lot called Lot 19, which has um, somewhat worse soil than this. And we've been very fortunate to have the support and advice and consult of all the city departments, stormwater, um, all through the planning efforts and the, the, uh, the fire department, the DPW, in putting this together. All have really weighed in to help us figure out how to make this happen. There are some new stormwater, 12-inch uh, stormwater line that has to be constructed as part of this. A couple of the salient points I want to, before I turn this over to, to Berkshire Design and, and to Kuhn Riddle for their comments, um, that development has uh, been eagerly seeking to develop the commercial side of the North Campus. And so with this, we have been able to partner with them and, and, and bring that forward, which is a new milestone. Um, you'll see that the property includes the original uh, gate posts for the uh, 1870s uh, uh, vintage of the entrance to the North Campus, the Old State Hospital. Those beautiful East Lake uh, sandstone pillars, which will be uh, in this plan relieved of the 1930s uh, cement block bus stop. A new bus stop approximately the street is part of this plan, which Mass Health is arranging for. And the pillars will remain. So the historic presence there, we hope to be able to light them, um, and uh, hence the name of them. Development as the gatehouse. So again, very pleased to be here. Thank you for your, your uh, attention to the details. And sure, okay, you're on. Jeff Squires from Berkshire Design Group. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're we're excited to. Um, you know, we've been involved with a lot of development at Village Hill from the start. Um, and you know, for me, it's a sort of a milestone in that. It's just this is really the first sort of sig uh, significant commercial project that, you know, I had the opportunity to work on up there. So, just to orient everybody, uh, Route 66 uh, runs across the bottom of the sheet on the western side is Village Hill Road, and it's really this parcel defined by this property line here, Lot 18. So it's this it's this corner lot, um, the existing gatehouse is, is right in this location. Um, there's right now a uh, split rail fence sidewalk in front of it, but the rest of the lot is largely undeveloped. Um, it's the site of uh, a couple of former homes, um, and um, I think there were two or three other homes that are buildings that were located between 19 and 18 that have since been removed. So it's um, it's a lot of overgrown vegetation, uh, some broken up asphalt, concrete, walks, etc. Um, so this is, um, and, and then just of note also is the grade significantly drops off on the eastern portion of the site. So that's, that's one characteristic that, you know, driving up Prince Street um, into Village Hill, that's it's one notable feature that you, you see coming up. Um, I'm just gonna sort of muddle through this, I think. So the current site plan right now um, is, um, takes advantage of that, that small portion of property that we're looking at, which is right along the back edge of, of this parking lot. And we've been working uh, with Mass Development to you know, orchestrate some of the uh, final meets and bounds for this property line to ensure that we can maximize the use of this site um, to the extent possible and still provide an attractive um, gateway into Village Hill. Um, really, as Jonathan pointed out, to you know, preserve these, these columns there, help define some sort of outdoor space um, as, as you turn that corner into, into Village Hill. Um, and again, the, um, the architecture, uh, Coon Riddle and uh, Chuck Roberts will speak more to the architecture, but really to create an inviting entrance into Village Hill. There's an existing curb cut off of Olander Drive that we're going to utilize. Um, it was always envisioned in the master plan that this would be some commercial component, some uh, mixed-use component for Village Hill. So that curb cut is, exists, and that's the one that is going to provide access into this site. Um, and potentially, you know, lot 19 when that gets developed. Um, 
And so what we've done is we've created a, a parking circulation where this entrance coming in can also serve to function uh, future development on lot, on lot 19, but it also creates an easy uh, route of circulation through this site. Um, and again, recognizing that um, you know that the parking lot, the southern portion of the parking lot, is um, you know in a fairly visible location. So we really made an effort to try and push that back far enough so that it, it wasn't overshadowing some of the other elements that we were trying to highlight, the columns um, in front of the, the, the end of the building, uh, et cetera. Um, ADA access was a challenge here because, because of the nature of the construction of the building. It's not a masonry building. Um, the grade drops uh, as you come down toward Prince Street off of Old uh, Village Hill Road. So there's a three or four foot elevation change that we've got to deal with. So providing ADA access into each of the entrances into the building as well as the patio um, was was a particular challenge, but I think we've you know we've accomplished that in a number of ways, both through ramps and by um, you know minimizing the number of uh, sort of penetrations into the building, the major entrances, and highlighting those as, as the key entrance, and others can serve as service entrances. Um, and there is um, again space at the southern portion of the building. Um, to enlarge that into a, a patio, the vision is you know some outdoor dining, some sort of interactive um, activity that takes people out, people outdoors, um, and breathes a little life into this corner of, of Village Hill. Uh, dumpster locations are off of this parking lot. Um, access would be obviously in through here, and service uh, trucks can exit. Um, there's provisions for uh, recycling and other um, you know other storage needs that might, um, might be required as a result of some of the uses in this building. Um, you know, uh, we'll speak to you know, the, the notion of the, the restaurant or the cafe, um, but that's, you know, until a tenant has been, has been um, signed there, there is some um, flexibility there. Uh, transform all the major utilities that would service uh, 19 and 18 have been accommodated. Uh, the electrical Electrical transformer, you know, again, we've tried to locate down here with the rest of the services. Um, that will provide service to both um, this project and any future project on lot 19. Um, additionally, the stormwater management. Um, this is one site uh, that we've been involved with up there that hasn't had the opportunity to take advantage so far of that larger detention basin, Basin 4 is what everybody refers it to. Um, so far, a portion of this northern um, campus, uh, this portion of the campus development largely has been um, directed toward that Basin 4. And this is one portion of the site that isn't, was never included in that calculation and had other provisions. So stormwater management on this site was a little bit more challenging um, both because of that and also because of relatively high groundwater. Um, the soils down at this portion of, of the campus in general have tended to be pretty poor. Um, they're high groundwater, there's sort of a um, perched groundwater table in there somewhere, um, but it's, we've, it's been discovered as, you know, as some of the other houses and developments and the roadway coming through were, were put in that, you know, that, that soil strata in there was, uh, was realized and it, and it extends really into you know a portion of the site, so what we've had to do is take advantage of the sandier portions of the site in this location. Um, and what we've done, knowing that um, lot 19 may be developed in the future, is to construct a stormwater system that was in fact larger than what we really need for this for this site. So this gray box here indicates a subsurface storage system, um, not unlike any others that you typically see. Uh, it gets discharged as the new drain line that is coming um, down toward Route 66, runs down parallel to the roadway and then ties into the drain line that was just installed in Prince Street. This was always part of the plan for this portion of development. It's just a question of how it, um, you know, how it manifested itself. And so that's as part of this project, that is that infrastructure is going to be installed with the idea that it provides some opportunity for Lot 19 to deal with their stormwater and have a place to go with it. Um, you know, otherwise we would just come in, you know, higher up um, on the street. But this is 
pushing it further north under this, you know, under this project, so that it um, it increases the opportunities for development on, on lot 19. Um, and um, you know, so all, all all of our stormwater is being captured on site. We're we're um, attenuating, treating it, doing everything that we need to do to satisfy um, DPW and their requirements. Um, site lighting. Just absolutely add, uh, interject there. Come back to that. that uh, this latest iteration showing the the storm line here uh, from Mass Development's engineers places it directly adjacent to the sidewalk, and that's not going to work. That's a great right point of this manhole is an eight foot. It's eight foot deep to the invert, so you'll see a sketch come forward that moves it a bit inboard so that the sidewalk doesn't have to be disturbed. This, uh, this was a revision that we got uh, the day of the submission, and uh, it just sur we just surfaced the fact that it's different than the earlier version. I don't think that's any particular uh, impact. I just wanted to, wanted to point that out. The other reason that we're going in down here into the street rather than further up, not only for lot 19, but because uh, just above this location, it trans transitions from a 12-inch line, which is over capacity, over demanded, so uh, it's uh, claimed to a 15-inch line which has capacities. That's the other reason we're coming here. <coughs> oh, one, one other thing? Sure. Um, sure. Just to explain the configuration of this lot, this lot was originally offered by Mass Development along this line here. And uh, uh, extensive discussions over many months about the the uh, presentation of this as a 20,000 square foot building with uh, 80 to 90 parking places um, led to, frankly, my insistence that there be enough land to do that. This is a 16,000 square foot building. And uh, so this piece of the property was intended. This portion of property here uh, has been reserved for lot 19 because this is the remaining area where there are any serviceable possible soils for infiltration. There's been some discussion in the neighborhood about why this was not shifted to the south, and at some pains to explain that uh, A, that's not the property that was offered for sale, and also that this has to be reserved for lot 19. It's not available to me. Uh, so just so you understand why that boot looks the shape that it is. So I'll just quickly try to highlight a couple of the other um, features. Um, site lighting. Um, there was a photometric plan that was submitted. I believe there were six site lights. Um, we've got two in the islands here. Um, there's addition, an additional one I know in this location. There's one in this location. I think there's one at the entrance way. Um, obviously, consideration was given to uh, the view coming up Prince Street up that hill, looking into the parking lot. Um, again, part of the you know transition into the planting plan, but part of the consideration was that preserving that view coming in um, coming into Village Hill. So we've planted some trees. You know, obviously, presenting uh, or leading up building that's visible from the street is, is a desirable thing. So we haven't planted up completely. There's a, there's a hedgerow. Uh, I forget what the plants are, but the objective was a three or four foot high hedgerow, essentially, in that location to provide some buffer uh, from the parking lot to the parking lot. Um, coming up the hill, you don't need a lot of height there to block the cars that are in there, so um, you know we've, we've done that with a, with a hedge. We've um, we protected the dumpster uh, enclosure. It's a fenced-in enclosure. There's also a transformer. There's some evergreen plantings, um, some hedges in there to, to buffer that. Um, again, a lot of the effort has been to dress up this corner of the building and also this side where all the um, uh, air conditioning connectors will be located. There will be a small farm of them, so to speak. I think there's eight in all. We've got a four-foot uh, wood fence around that, um, and in addition, we've planted a hedgerow around that. It is set back quite a bit from the street, which is um, one advantage that we've got. 
and so there is a little bit of room here to really, you know, provide some buffer there. So we've done that with plantings. There's also two existing trees, just while I'm thinking of it, um, that are they were planted as street trees on this uh, on this edge of the parallel parking. As part of this, we're going to uh, transplant those up into this location again to to try and you know beef up that that buffer on that end. Um, we've also planted a similar hedgerow to this up on this northern edge to protect views um, into the parking lot from Olander Drive. All the, all the other trees that you see here um, are existing trees in, in some size or uh, capacity. All of those will remain for the time being until something come for, comes forward for 19, uh, but there's no need to take anything down more than what we've got for, for our site. Um, open up to questions, and unless there's anything else that can bring up forward. Or... Sure, oh yeah. Jeff, I, I have one. Yes. Yeah. On, on the plantings you just referenced on this drawing on the north side of the park right there, that hedgerow. It yes. does not sh it shows there, but not on the planting. There was a revised planting plan that I emailed to Carol on Wednesday night, I think. And that is what And that's that is, that was one yeah. of the concerns that came up. Do you have that to show on the board on the street? Uh, I should, yes. shows uh, some improved plantings of ground cover on the traffic island. Right. Upgraded from grass to, to the ground cover. Okay. There's no way to retain any of the existing trees in that zone. Uh, let me just outline the zone where the, there's some existing trees in that area that are that are lovely, but they're also in uh, firmly, squarely in the middle of the only decent drainage uh, area that is available on the site. And since there are no provisions for uh, off-site disposal, of any more stormwater than is currently leaving the site naturally, all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, impervious surface has to be uh, treated in that one area. So that unfortunately means that there's a large sycamore tree there, tulipwood tree, very handsome tree um, that everyone understands has to come down. Can you describe exactly what's in this plant schedule for that area along Olander? Along Olander. Is there one in the revised plan? Yes, up in here. Yeah. So I know there's some, here's first grasses and tall grasses. These three MSAs. I know um, our miscanthus species, that's probably six or seven feet. Um, the other ones are. By Burns. Karen Bay Bush by Burns, I believe. Are the other ones here. Which again grow to six feet. Um, along there we've got all a, deciduous. What's that? All deciduous? Yes. Yeah. I think one of the things to remember is that all of the services for lot 19 come in here. There's electrical coming in here. Here's the six-inch water service, which has to transition through this area. It's a very intensive utility area. Those utilities are that's where they're provided to us. So uh, planting has to has to work around that. But we're certainly open to, you know, changing out the species or putting something that's an evergreen species in there. I think the notion was to keep it somewhat transparent and open, not you know put a dense evergreen hedge or what would look like that, but I'm, I'm, I have no issues with changing those out of the board first, so. And yeah, you want to talk about the building? Well, can you, yeah, I've got a question about that diagram. Which? Well, the ones with the trees on it that you just had up. Right. This one. So that's a, a really appealing way it did show the shielding from 66 as you come up out of town the building you know is kind of nestled back in there and in fact none of those trees are going to stay no and it's built all the way to the lot line so you can't you can't do anything around the parking lot once those trees go away 
Oh, wait a minute. Which, which lot line? Let me just make sure I understand. Oh, the parking lot line on the... On the uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I think I get the answer. I'm just disappointed with it. I'm not, I'm not sure which, which property line, but I'm not sure what the answer is. So. Uh, between lot 18 and 19. Here? Um, right there, here. yes. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. right. That That is a grading easement uh, preparatory to the uh, development of lot 19. Okay. I, I just... Um, I'm disappointed that we can't do anything to, to shield the parking lot. I mean, I know you're doing what you can on the on the dog leg side that has the you know the cutout for the drainage for lot 19 for lot 19, but you know. The, I mean, this I, this this within the, a year or two, one hopes will be developed into a continuing parking. There will be, in all likelihood, a parking island there. It's just that. For us to put that in without a plan, it'll just get ripped out. Right. And since there, this is full of natural uh, tree cover now. Anyway, there's there's really nothing to shield it from. I understand if if it were to be an empty lot, we, you know, we would certainly bring forward some planning for that. Right. I, I guess I'm looking forward, thinking, okay, so when we do get the companion lot developed, we'll be talking to them about ways to shield the parking lot from 66. The parking lot from 66. You can't. I think you, you can't see this from 66. 66 is uh, I, nine feet lower I, 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 here, way down here. I'm, just, I'm not sure what the, the visual on. You don't see any of this. When you get to here, you will see this uh, four-foot embankment that comes up to the parking that's, that's planted. Okay. That has to be at that level because all of that water has to be brought up and sent back to the treatment on site. So uh, this whole thing is a you know is a, is a great big. Uh, you know, baking pan, trying to co collect that water and direct it back. So uh, there's a grading easement that Mass Development will provide us in order to make this a comely transition, but it, for now, this part would be uh, uh, just graded and seeded because it's going to have to be altered in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we get to the architectural, are there any other site issues? Because I know DPW already has some Questions. Just while we're still on the, the planting, it your plan says that all plant materials are only guaranteed for one year. What happens after one year? Those they're guaranteed by the installer for one year. The uh, the building owner still has a responsibility to maintain the property. That's a that's a spec for the landscaping installer. That's that whole thing about others will buy others will even help others. Oh, we're right there. Yes, they're 72 percent, and the, there are two additional um, spaces there, which amount to about 3,700 square feet. Both are restricted um, to be uh, non-office for for three years, uh, which is to give the uh, the building owner time to find commercial tenants. The reason behind this whole project was uh, to find a way to create a mixed-use solution that was not a glass box that went dark at 5:02 p.m. And uh, so that that has been the, the, the heaviest lifting uh, in this in this. Uh, and I, I'm very pleased that we can bring you that, uh, secure it in this way. It's uh, that part of the property has not yet begun to be marketed. Why only three years? I mean, there, that is clearly the problem here is, is developing that kind of um, use for the property. I, I'm concerned. Um, we had it as 10, it's a deal breaker for the building buyer. They feel that carrying the property for three years uh, without a tenant is burden enough. Um, they have interested tenants. They've already informally started to market this. There's interest in potentially a restaurant uh, facility there. But if none of that pans out, they've got to be able to use the property, and it is a permitted use. When I became involved in this project, 
uh, the best prospects that the realtors could put forward was essentially a strip mall. The only reason that you're seeing a two-story mixed-use building here is brief revival design because as I'm a stubborn son of a gun, and I want to see this benchmark set at a high level. But there's only so far I can pull uh, my end buyer uh, and that major tenant you know, with me. They have, to, they have commercial realities of their own. So that's the balance that we hit. I, I hope it's acceptable. Um, I think three years is probably long enough to... I would be very surprised if we weren't sitting here a year from now having uh, gone to dinner there, or a year and a half from now having gone to dinner there. I'm surprised, but I've been surprised before. Your treat. <laughs> My treat. Uh, the coffee's ask, on me. Can I ask Carolyn a question? Um, mass development, do they have any obligation relative to the development? You know, because we have always talked about the system of use and the one, I mean, where's the village of Village Hill, right? Right. There's no village. So, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, well, I think there, uh, I guess I would say um, the contractual arrangement with um, the developer to create a mixed-use building is as far as they can take it and they, they've approved it, they approved the sale, and you're seeing a two-story potential for mixed-use. I think my concern um, originally, I think, just um, step beyond what um, John had stated is that you know, for a long time, it seemed like what we were going to get was going to be one story, mm -hmm. and maybe at the end, I mean, we, I think at some point there were even three stories. <laughs> I'm wondering about that site. Um, I mean, you know, that didn't go very far, but I think those are the kinds of things that were um, <coughs> um, potentially um, what would happen out there would, would be a single story. So I think the fact that it's two-story building, even if it doesn't get to be mixed use, at this point it's set up for mixed use. Mm -hmm. So maybe the first time around, if after three years it um, doesn't get um, multiple different types of tenants in it, it's it's constructed in a way that will enable that, and I think that's the best possible solution that, that you can get. Because then it, it allows flexibility you know, going into the future, well into the future. I mean, I appreciate that. I just I, I go back to my conclusion about you know how the CAC's involvement and how this development was being, how you know, we all talked about this very much being an excuse development. And I don't know how we got so far. Yet. Well, actually, I think this is a step back Tor towards, towards that moving the plan, even from one of the master plans that the planning board never said that they really liked was having the assisted living facility right there prominently on that corner because it really would be more of a dead zone, I guess, if you will. But it's not, I mean, <laughs> 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 I yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, more that it's, I mean, it's having a quiet zone. I mean, it's the after <laughs> five o'clock thing, but even, but all, more of the time. Um, because it's not the same kind of activity you have coming and going throughout the entire day. So it doesn't generate the same that's what I really was intending to get across is that it's, you know, the big, bulky assisted living facility was never something that I think was very palatable to the planning board. So that's off the table now. And then these two potential new buildings that um, are much more in keeping with the idea of creating um, mixed uses on and off. I think, you know, I, um, as the building developer but not end owner and landlord, um, I have kind of limited things that I can say with any knowledge, but Demetrius Panalakis, who's the uh, managing director of Opal, is here, and I think you might want to address that, because he's the one who's been doing the marketing for the other spaces. I don't know. Demetrius, do you want to take a minute? Sure. Thank you. Good evening. Um, difficult project. Um, it's the old adage in development, you can't have everything. Um, this is a building that will set the standard in Northampton for efficiency and green use. That being said, it's being done in a building that probably be, should be twice the size to economically support what we're trying to accomplish. So it's taking a commitment in Village Hill and a commitment in the project that this is the kind of building 
that should be built for the long term. This is not a short term building. This is a long term ownership building. Um, so it takes that kind of commitment. The margins on this building are very slim. One of the most difficult things for Kuhn Riddle in this process as we became involved was that there's no back to the building. This is a 360 degree building. Uh, there's nowhere to hide anything. So you really had to develop and design the building so that it had an appearance that was aesthetically pleasing <laughs> all around from every angle. Um, the finishes of the building, the type of materials being used in the building exceed anything that I believe that I've seen in the city to this stage. Um, it's a trophy building. Uh, unlike, and most trophy buildings are very expensive. Uh, this one maintained its expensiveness because of its stubbornness of its, of its builder. Um, and um, we really got sold on the project because this was a building that uh, our organization would be proud to own. Uh, as it pertains to the retail, I kind of look at it a little differently. When somebody says mixed use, I'm still looking at the aesthetics of the building. On a closer inspection of the building, you will see that this building can be used now and in the future to accommodate just about every use. But on the first level, um, across the board, it looks like a high-end retail. Um, all the doors that and, and oversized windows that don't need to be there and aren't being used, as you look at it right now from the streetscape, um, there are potential doors and oversized windows there that are not accessible. Uh, they can be used as exits and they're the front of the building, uh, but yet they're being designed as the back of the building. So without creating too much confusion, the front of the building had to be designed as the back of the building. Um, so it was complicated. Um, we are looking for uh, retail. We believe that drives the rest of the development. We are aggressively pursuing Lot 19 in order to continue the development because that's where we feel that you're really going to get the village that you're looking for. Um, and I think it has to be kept in mind that this is the first step of that development. Uh, when you develop the, the, the next building, which we are hoping that we are a part of and we hope that it's of the size of 23 to 25,000 square feet, um, you're going to get that village that you're looking at. So we're not just looking at the building in isolation. I know we're doing that tonight, but I think we have to look at it as an overall development. Um, although we're saying that we have a three-year option, we really have designed the inside of that for a restaurant. <laughs> I'm not sure what we would do to go in any other direction um, because everything in there is really designed to accommodate a restaurant. And it, at this point, if we did not put a restaurant in there, it wouldn't be cost effective um, because of the money that's being spent up front to do it. Any questions I can answer? And thank you very much for pointing out that we were only given a one-year warranty on the trees. I'm going to have to, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and, and, and try to get somewhere, something better than a, than a Lowe's uh, um, guarantee on my trees. Any questions? Thank you. Hi there, I'm Charles Roberts, Q Riddle Architects. Dimitri stole my best line, which is that there's no back to this building, so I can't you know, go there again. But it, it really is true. Um, and is, I guess as you all know, there's, there are guidelines up in Village Hill. We out um, for, the, for the buildings, all the, the residences, and now this new commercial development that uh, arts and crafts, farmhouse, Colonial, Greek Revival, I think there may be one or two Victorian. others. Victorian. Victorian, right. And so um, there's, uh, those, other, those other types are all pretty well represented up there. In fact, um, I've done some projects up there with Jonathan over the years. And, um, and it really made sense to just to bring uh, the, uh, the Greek Revival expression, design expression, to this place, to this point in the site. It's very, has a certain kind of formality, and it's, it's, it's very recognizable at the same time. It lends itself to uh, to simple geometries. Greek revival in general tends to be a fairly straightforward um, geometric, um, not overly romanticized way of, of, of looking at building and detailing, which which uh, worked out well on this site because of its, its its linear nature. It's very tight, um, so it, it uh, lent itself well to what we were trying to accomplish here. Um, this is this is the. Uh, 
This is this, uh, the, the elevation running along uh, Village Hill Drive, Village Hill Road. Um, there's two main entries into this building. This entrance right here goes into what, what hopefully is going to be the restaurant and then a mercantile space here. This entry goes into uh, to Fazzi, which will be occupying the first floor of this building and the entire second floor. It can be subdivided in the future if necessary so that we actually have four discrete retail spaces downstairs. The, plan, the plans are designed to be very flexible and, uh, and the cores are designed to be able to subdivide this building up into two potential tenant spaces upstairs, again, four tenant spaces downstairs, so we've taken a lot of pains to really to really make the uh, make the plan flexible. There's a lot going on behind that, you know, simple rhythm of those windows to, to make that happen. Um, it was also, you know, creating these, these these various entry points as an opportunity to take a, what's, what's essentially a long linear building and start to break up uh, the rhythm of the fenestration along this elevation here. So. There's, there's a there's a there's a geometric regularity, but there's also some some variation in play that happens with increasing the base size here at this entry into into Fazzi and starting to uh, you know develop different window sizes, different kind of fenestration patterns. Um, the uh, this building here, which is the which is the, uh, the restaurant on the first floor, we have pumped up the windows. They're they're an extra foot in height, which which helps just you know give this a, a nicer scale on the corner. This is. Uh, these, these uh, perspectives here kind of help give a give you a sense a little bit, I think, of. Sorry, I don't. I didn't have this like, digitally put together here. But this this is the view as you're as you're entering onto Village Hill Road from uh, from from the west on 66. So by by taking this this uh, restaurant part of the building and making that a turn gable that faces the street, it really it uh, it anchors that corner of the building on the on the lot and helps create a, uh, a sense of, of place and, de and define the, uh, the outdoor dining area that, we've got, that, we, that we're looking at here. Let me see if I can actually... Can you turn the first to go around just so you Oh, sure, see. sorry. That's okay. This is from the northwest corner, as, it, as you could, if you were exiting the uh, Village Hill North Campus, and this is if you're entering. So that's so that yeah, that view is taken basically from here, looking at looking at this this portion of the building, which is the restaurant. This is the outdoor dining area. So as you come in and out of the site, the, the you know the vision is to make have that be a very active, inviting place. People hanging out out there and having coffee, discussing business, <laughs> the uh, joys of life. Um, the, this this so this really does the the front and the back aspect that uh, Demetrius was referring to is. This, this is the street edge, which is formally the front of the building. This is what we would think of as the back, but which, which is actually also a front because everybody who works in this building and comes here to go to the restaurant and, and, and potential um, customers who are coming to the mercantile places are going to be entering in through this side of the building. So it really does end up having to... Uh, You don't have a slide of that other picture. This one. Yeah. Could you hold that up again? I don't. I'm sorry. Could, could you show what entrances would be used for the okay, rest? Sure. Um, <coughs> the, the, this is there, there's my you know, see there's there's two entrances into the restaurant. This is the this is the entrance along Village Hill Road, and that's the one that's accessible off the sidewalk and sort of creates that street presence. There's another entry here under under this awning, and that faces out onto the dining area and it actually will that actually will be the main way that people coming who are parking in the parking lot will access this building will come through they'll come through the landscape courtyard and then enter end the restaurant through that door. There's a back door as well which I can show you on the plan. There, so, there are also provisions for an ATM uh, enhanced ATM at this entrance. Oh well, here they are. Look at that. Um, so right so this is the restaurant entrance this is the restaurant entrance this is the entrance to uh, Bazzi um, on the north end. <coughs> it took me a while to remember it. So. Um, this is the first floor plan, which shows the core backed up here, 
along the uh, the east side of the building, and the uh, the tenant space is uh, facing out on, onto the street, yet accessible um, through the back through the uh, the back front door here from the parking area. This this shows the potential demarcation line between uh, what what could be a, a potentially fourth tenant space. You have one, two, three, four on the first floor, and then upstairs. This is this is going to all be one space um, at the Clyde by Fazzi, but could all potentially um, function as two two spaces, each with their own suite of bathrooms, kitchenettes, and uh, require egress. So this is This is this is the um, so this this is the, uh, the the street elevation along Village Hill. Again, this it's the same same information about the entrances. This is this is the, the ele elevation that faces out towards the street. So we've created a uh, parking lot. Uh, the parking lot. So this is the uh, the main entry for everybody coming from the parking into a central location in the core area that gets you uh, to all the various tenant spaces. This would be the area on the site plan where, where you uh, you come in through the, the landscape courtyard and you enter underneath the salon and into the restaurant. Um, the, uh, the it's all it's all uh, very durable construction. It's going to be uh, two by six framing, uh, engineered trusses, floor joists, uh, uh, fiber cement siding, which is which is a great durable product. Composite trim, um, built up trim for the corner boards, the eaves, the uh, Freeze boards, all that, uh, all that uh, re revival detailing, window trim, and uh, it's uh, so it's really built to last and uh, convey good old New England simplicity. Thanks. Any questions? So, just to clarify, all the doors, all the entry points on Village Road will be fully operational. Right. The doors. Yep. Just to clarify what Dimitri said, I think the, uh, the the northerly of those is unlikely to see a lot of regular use unless people are walking to work. Right. Um, we, we have all wished for and imagined an ambulatory community where people live and walk to work, but in fact, Fazzi Associates needs 42 cars to park 42 cars for the people to, to drive there because people come from all over. We haven't made the transition to a walking city yet. And, uh, we have provisions for bikes and so on, but we have to somehow hang in this never-never land where we feel like we could all walk there, but most people may not. So, how are you going to manage the snow in the winter? Are you going to put it on the in, in the building or on the parking lot? Well, the um, I think yeah. I mean, obviously, we'll take advantage of any of the green space that's you know available to us. You know, for until the, for the time being, a lot can go here. I'm sure at some point, um, you know, these islands will store a certain amount of snow. Um, you know, there'll have to be some thought put into, you know, exactly how, how we manage that. It's, you know, obviously it's, the goal is not going to be to pile it up on all the shrubs that are uh, serving as a, you know, for a functional purpose, um, you know, to shield the parking lot. And so there's going to be um, a need to, you know, consider those sorts of things. So if it needs to get pulled out of there, then that's, that's what will have to happen. Um, bike racks. Where, how many and where are they? 
there's three bike racks up in this location. Um, and I think um, those are also probably on the revised set of plans because we did. There were ones shown there previously, but we upped the up the count by two or three anyway. And there's also um, two or three down at, on this corner of the building, seeing as how um, you know people coming up Route 66 or from across um, you know across the, the, um, the Port Morgan site. Um, you know, we, we need a place to park so. That, those are all just simple one loop. Yes. Yeah. What was the total count? On the I think there's a parking for six bikes in each loop in each location. So twelve total, I believe. I think there's three racks. You can park a bike on either side. Yeah. Like five and three. Five on the north. Okay. Two on the south, I think. You don't have this revised plan for the overview. Um, actually, we'll So there's one, two, three on the north side, um, and there's two, there's like two there, two on the south. Yep. So there's five total. So parking for, for ten bikes. Yeah. So they asked a request for stamped plans as required by uh, PE. Mm -hmm. So that can be done in private construction. Um, the proposed alignment of the driveway may make um, access to the rear of the building for Lot 19 difficult for larger trucks. They want to see that um, there are turning radii for the ladder truck um, or at least uh, WB40 can be met. So um, I know we talked about that, um, and um, that can certainly be shown on the vice plan. Yeah. Just so everybody's aware, I mean, we did we did do the turning analysis, and we you know, satisfied the fire department with what they needed. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm somewhat surprised that the comment came through because that that curb cut has always been shown and designed to accommodate you know this sort of use, this sort of traffic. It's a 28. Foot wide curb cut with uh, 25 or 30 foot diam uh, radius. It's it's a big road. It's a big road. Your comment wasn't for this property; it was for the one for 19. Um, it was for making the turn to go to 19. Electrical line from the proposed transformer to the building is shown passing uh, through the stormwater infiltration infiltrators in the parking lot. And through an inspection port for the infiltrators, is this a conflict? And can the electric line be run outside the infiltration area? Um, clean out. So, I don't know. Do you want these to be answered as I read through them, or do you want me to just some of them are pretty? Yeah. I mean, that can that can certainly be rerouted. These are meant to be not schematic in nature, but they're not 100 percent you know construction documents. It's it's designed to show because of all the line work going on 
that they need to get a secondary service connection from the transformer to the building, if it's easier to place it shallow and go across the top of the detention basin, it can be. If it needs to be rerouted, it can be rerouted. It's, it's a site construction related issue. It's not a code issue it's why it right. would prevent it from crossing through the, uh, condition. the strata uh, beneath the paving before you get to the, the detention basin. There's no, there's no code reason that it can't go there. I think the comment is meant to be helpful. Did we, did we read our plans? The answer is yes. Um, and we would rather not go around it because it's a, it adds about 40 feet to 50 feet to the secondary line, which is inefficient. Um, clean out and the sewer service is required. They um, offer some options of how that could be done because it's um, uh, sewer main hall 11. The applicant proposes extending an existing water service stub off the lander across the corner of Lot 18 to Sir 19. It would require adding a 45 degree bend to the existing 45 bend, and there's a question about um, actually DPW asked that uh, a new um, um, valve be installed at the property line to go directly to 19 instead of routing around and just going back to the old lander. These are where the services are right now for both 18 and 19. So um, actually, these, these were envisioned. There's, there's a water service directly in front of a Village Hill Road that we're taking advantage of here. There's another six-inch line that come in off, comes in off of Olander Drive that ends just prior to the parking lot. And in thinking about the future development of Lot 19, the goal was to try and get that stub location out from underneath the pavement and any work that we've got to do as part of this project so that when 19 comes along, we can simply have a tap, service tap available that doesn't involve, you know, excavating under the parking lot. That's the reason it's there. The service is already in, um, so we've got to put a 45 to get it out of the parking lot. Um, we've indicated a valve, it's right. I don't see any issues. That location does not serve both lots, so I'm clear about that. Right. They, they understand that it serves 19. They're, they're requesting that it be relocated to the west point um, to the, to the um, you know, going back to the, the where is, is this the um, location of it now? Is no, it, it's... Is it further up over here? It is right there right now. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. This is it. This yeah, is it. So it goes here. Yes. Instead of doing this, this and over, they point back here and just going directly, is what they're saying. You want to go back to the street? Well, I mean, I mean, that's basically what this is saying, which I don't quite understand. I mean, that's what they were suggesting. That, that line was located uh, exactly where it is to preserve two trees. What they're doing, what they're asking to do, would take out a major street tree. That's why it's located on that weird angle. So we, so we it's trees up here. Um, a lot of discussion about and Sarah Northrup, who's the uh, engineer for mass development, made kind of a fuss about having that line terminate at that angle in order to save that tree. Okay. Um, not everybody's concerned, but certainly a common concern that, that we're aware of. It would be mass development's responsibility and something that they might ask us to do. Uh, I have no objection to doing it, but I just want everyone to understand that it might, it might involve uh, tree loss. Um, moving to drainage, the roof drain connections um, to the storm drain system are not clear. Two connections are shown for the rear corners of the building, but the architectural plans show downspouts on the front of the building as well. And the question is, will there be, will the front downspouts connect to the storm drain, and if so, where? Um, and where will, and how will the discharge be managed? Yes, all the, all, this, all the roof drains are being picked up and directed into the stormwater system. So then on plans, you can clarify. We can. On every plan, it's the same. And they're all yes. going to the system. Um, the next point is a, um, about the polyethylene liner. Um, replacing the um, fabric along the south side of the proposed infiltrators. Mm -hmm. And um, they're concerned that the, um, the 
this detail is intended to prevent breakouts in the infiltration system. EPW doesn't feel like it's an effective means to do that. Um, and if water, and it will be on owner's responsibility to mitigate if it breaks and cause the storm to sidewalk, which I think is not <laughs> um, The space between the infiltrator pipes is approximately one foot wide, and the details. Um, Concerned about the um, compaction, achieving 95% compaction, compaction um, and uh, whether or not, if it doesn't get achieved, then there may be different settling patterns in the, in the parking lot. We, um, uh, we've retained HDE geotechnical engineers. Um, we've done uh, six borings, we've done uh, test pits down to 11 feet. Um, there's approximately $72,000 of. Uh, Fill replace, structural fill replacement that has to be done with the footings and floors of the building. The entire site will be proof rolled uh, with engineering inspection prior to any work. So uh, just that's what's going to happen and um, should be fine. Um, just so you know, it looks like undisturbed soil. And in fact, uh, there's between three and nine feet of uh, mixed fill there. Some of it wood debris, some of it all kinds of uh, urban rubble from pre-1932. That's when the, the main concrete road was the 12-inch concrete road that runs through here was placed there. It was placed over this material. So we discovered where it is. We know how we're going to deal with it, and uh, uh, we have the geotechnical support and the engineering support and the structural support to make sure that it doesn't move. Um, the next several comments are about outlet structures and pipe details and things like that. So I think though the, these could probably be addressed in um, conditions to clarify their different pipes used in different locations. So I don't know that we, I need to read through all of those, but I just wanted to let you know, I mean, if you're willing to you know, put it on a condition that the final plan show consistent connections and that PPW has some suggestions about changing the location Drain line connections and manholes, but those can be done, I think, through administrative review and not wouldn't address the site plan. Um, DPW will require that prior to issuance of building permit and executed stormwater operation maintenance inspection agreement and, and binding on all subsequent owners of land served by the storm private stormwater facility be recorded in, at the registry of deeds and must be approved by DPW prior to the final signature. Um, and uh, DPW received a letter August 24th from Brian Darnold, Berkshire Design Group, stating that the proposed subsurface infiltration basin has been designed with extra capacity that was described earlier. Um, DPW requests further documentation that the minimum capacity for a lot of team documentation of how the extra volume calculated um, and the calculations submitted shall be stamped by um, a PE uh, and will also require that during the permitting for lot 19 the easements necessary to send that water to that infiltrator um, will be in place. No increase in peak flow rates from pre-construction um, of either 18 or 19 are allowed in the post-construction condition. Um, and I'll just Clarify that this permit doesn't require, I think, I don't know if you said this before, it doesn't require a stormwater permit because it falls under the purview of the um, overall stormwater permit that's already issued. So basically, they've shown that they're sort of fitting into that space that was already sort of created in the original permit. Um, and then a uh, question about whether the photometrics um, plan adequately shows. Light, enough lighting at Olander sidewalk to eliminate the sidewalk, um, and also the um, pole heights are shown um, as in one place the schedule says 18 foot pole heights, and in another place in the details is 14 feet. So 18. Yeah. 18 feet. Yes. Okay. And there and are street lights, just to clarify, along Olander that are existing. 
that were put there. And are there 16 or 18? Because I think Checking the minimum, that what they've noted is that the standard calls for a maximum of 16. CPW wants to eliminate one on all handles because of the street light? No, they're just, um, they want to make sure that there's enough. The photometric plan shows the driveway um, dimly illuminated at the sidewalk crossing. No. And there is a street light on the opposite right. side, but they want to make sure there's enough lighting to eliminate this crossing. Yeah, the photometric plan obviously didn't pick up the, you know, the existing lights. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, so I guess the board could take the position they should be 16 foot poles to meet the maximum unless you want to waive that. Yeah, I think I need you to speak to that because one of the concerns was getting uh, sufficient light spread within the right. site to find around 14 to 18. Mm -hmm. um, I need you guys to tell us do we need 18? I, I, that's really up to you guys to say do we need 18 foot poles? We can condition it 15, 16, but if we don't have adequate light for safety, I don't think that's really the intent either. For limited locations, uh, we don't want to have them just next to the building. We don't want to have any kind of wall pack on the building. And so we have the two traffic islands and either in the parking lot, the only place that we can locate lights, which is why they're done the way they are. Um, and uh, I thought on the elevation to show wall packs, no? No, there's some low gooseneck type oh, fixtures, okay. but there's no wall packs that would serve the light, you know, the parking lot. So we are, as Jonathan pointed out, we're limited to the two traffic islands in, um, in the middle um, and, you know, trying to be cognizant of, um, you know, the future outdoor dining space and not putting a, you know, light bulb glaring right in their space and looking up, um, coming up Route 66. So we really put some effort into um, strategically, strategically locating some of these poles so that they wouldn't interfere with, um, you know, both the current use but also, um, you know, the... the potential build up for lot 19. Um, and the higher pole height does provide some extra assurance of, of safety. <coughs> because we, that, that extra couple of feet does increase the foot candles enough to alleviate some of the concerns. <coughs> Their questions was the light at the crosswalk to eliminate, uh, and that's with an 18 foot pole down. So we know we need to sit in. That would be the worst situation. So there's a limit of 16, but we can offer it 18. And does their photometric plan factor in the two the street lights? That's yeah. what that's what no. I'm thinking is right. that that would solve that. And actually, it's an interesting problem because under the uh, the uh, zero light spillage uh, dark skies, um, we're we're not supposed to light past the front door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we've got we've got one pole at this you know this first green face. And then there's another one, a street, you know, street light that's over in this location. I mean, looking at the lighting, um, that the, the worst spot is, is there, mm -hmm. but that doesn't address, that doesn't take into a, right. account the, the existing light across the street. With 16, mm -hmm. if the lighting levels could be met uh, such that it's not a safety issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you would do that without doing the calcs and, 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 and reflecting the light across the street to show how that comes into a land or into the crosswalk. And then if it was, if it was bad, then you could, you could say 18. But I don't want to stretch this out. <coughs> or you say 18 is fine. From a from an applicant standpoint, we would prefer 16. We started lower and we kind of gave in 
reluctantly to the additional height mm -hmm. for all the reasons that Jeff met, uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm happy to have you instruct us to try to make it work with 16, but I don't want to do it to add a bunch more lights, which complicate the, the wiring and um, I don't think can be placed at the north end of the parking lot in a way that doesn't spill out of the property lot. And I think it's when you have a lighting level on sidewalks and streets, it's really important to be consistent and not have you know, bright spots and dark spots, because that's much harder for people to, uh, uh, to, to adjust to. We make a condition that they use the same light picture at, with a 16-foot height and do a photometric output, which includes the light across the street, and PPW is okay with it. We stay. If they're not, we go back to the and we're, we'd certainly be willing to go out and measure the light levels at that, you know, we've got a photometric meter, we can go out and measure the, the light levels at that sidewalk at that location and see what they are now with that, with that existing fixture just to provide some guidance as to whether, you know, it merits, you know, an 18 foot hole in that location. If the light levels are pretty high now, we may not need it. So, and then keep 16 and rest for the rest of the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what response. you could say is, um, you know, um, if the photometric shows the need for more lighting at that site, then 18 feet would be allowed, otherwise mm -hmm. 16 feet on the site. That's fine. Yeah, that's Better. great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Right, that was it. That's all. <laughs> uh, any other questions from the board before we hear from the public? Is anyone here from the public uh, raise your hand to speak about this project? Okay, uh, uh, I'll call you. What's that? Yeah. Who was that? Um, if you come to the podium, state your name and address, and then uh, speak to the board. And if there's questions, we can go back and forth. But um, questions and answers are from the speaker to the board, not from the speaker to the applicant, and so forth. So um, come on up right here. And Good evening. My name is Ken Albert, and I live at 27 Olander Drive. And that's, uh, I think it's designated as Lot 1 there. Um, first of all, Nora and I, my wife, Nora and I, uh, moved in a little over a year ago. And we love Village Hill. We think it's great development. And we're looking forward to seeing next year's development. We knew when we purchased it and moved there that that's what it was going to be. And uh, in terms of the building, I think the design team has done what looks to me like an excellent job. And we have no, no issue with the uses. With the office use, I hope to get a convenience store or, or better a restaurant and we'll remain hopeful and we'll see what happens. Our concerns really have to do with the site plan and more of the uh, subdivision. And procedurally, we are not familiar with, we, we know mass development is, is heavily involved with this, but ultimately I think this board needs to approve the subdivision to make this happen. That's incorrect. Let me know. But our issue is this area, one, and essentially what we consider to be an insufficient buffer area. One of the things that hasn't come up today is there is an apartment complex right across the street. I know you know that. And it's my impression that they're going to be staring straight at a sea of aspirin. Uh, in addition to that, the second concern is, and it shows up on the other drawing, but there, there are, there is some old growth in this area. There are three uh, Norway spruces that are 100, you know, they're probably 120 years old or 100 years old, and they're about 100 feet tall. And, um, one of them is, uh, I wouldn't call a wonderful specimen, but the other two are. And 
the way the driveway is configured means that this whole this whole old growth area is going to be decimated when lot 19 gets developed. Not only that, but it will be way north and it will eliminate any buffer between obviously the residential unit and what will be a parking lot. In addition, the way the way the subdivision is laid out with this line. There is no buffer between, there's no green space on the east property line. That's a, a very unusual in a mixed use development where residential is involved to have no planting strip. The curb line is built literally on the, uh, on, on the property line, or very close to it. And it's pretty evident to me when the new lot is developed or redeveloped that we're going to have not just the sea of asphalt with 62 cars but I just heard 23,000 feet I don't know of, of new construction on 19 or a wish for that um, I actually was under the impression that a 10,000 square foot medical building might be in the works but but again, the, these are things I don't know about, and I don't want to speculate too much. But one 10,000 square foot medical building might entail at five spaces to a thousand feet, which is fairly typical. Um, a 50 car wide, which would be perfectly reasonable and could be brought down to this level, quite, which would provide for more than adequate buffer. And what I just heard, 23,000 square feet, um, quite frankly, concerns me even more than anything we've discussed to date, because we're going to have a parking lot that runs right up to the trails, as far as I can see. You can just do the multiple yeah, at four cars, a thousand, or whatever, you, whatever your ordinance says. Then we're talking about an 80 or a 90 car parking lot, and I can do the math in a few, few minutes, but I can tell you that that's here. With this, with this entry point, any developer that does 19 has no choice. You can't make a, a, a right turn as you come in. You're coming right across, and again, all that old growth gets decimated. So I, I had a discussion with Jonathan, that, and I do understand that he has certainly, or has told me, he has very limited, if no, control over this subdivision. Again, we're very supportive of this project. So I'm in a somewhat difficult position. But at the same time, I see what's happening. I would like to share with you uh, uh, just a sketch that I did, if that's, if you feel that's appropriate. Is that all right? Sure.
I'm not on the board. things, uh, the first thing that jumps out looking at this, and we obviously put a lot of time into this, but the, the boot jump, and you were talking about the property one, the reason there's that cutout at the bottom, can you um, go over that again, that's the property, those are the, those are the property constraints that you're working with them. It is, that's what's, uh, uh, that's what I asked about, um, nine months to get that. Change the property lines would require uh, back to your board to the December meeting, which could kill the project. The delivery date was uh, September 2013 as part of the lease, and um, I cannot I cannot redesign the project in the time frame. So I'm not unsympathetic to the concern. It's not an option that's been offered to me. Um, there's uh, 22 feet from parking to the street. There's no no buffering on the parking at the apartments across the street. All the planting buffers between Olander Drive and the apartments that is there now was put there under easement by right builders to protect the owners of lots one, two, and three. Um, none of it was paid for by, by those building owners or mass development. We do have to discuss more planting if you like. <clears throat> I have mixed feelings about levels of planting if you build a green wall then that's not necessarily safe uh, for pedestrians. It, it provides a potential hideout for, uh, it just, it, I think visual contact between the sidewalk and the parking is good. That's just my personal opinion. I think the base issue here is the extension of the road uh, across adjacent to, uh, to, to the, the bike path on, uh, on lot 19. That's not up for review tonight. Um, the master plan calls for a 10,000 square foot footprint, two-story building, which is 20,000 square feet. The developability of lot 19 is solely driven by the feasibility of the soils. Uh, it's not clear that what, if anything, actually can built, be built there because the soils are so questionable. That's helpful context. May I just say a few words about this? Sure. Um, first of all, I have to tell you, it only took me a few hours. So I appreciate your comment, but it's really hardly a lot of work. Um, and I did it because after discussing possible changes with Jonathan, and Jonathan was very forthcoming, I explained that he didn't think changes in the subdivision were possible. And I accept that. I, at this point, I don't know what to do. Uh, because I, uh, both Nora and I are supportive of the project. But I do want to point out two things to you. One is, by changing the subdivision, you could transform the buffer area between the apartment complex and the parking area. And you would then have in the neighborhood of 20-something, actually more, but 25 feet. And, and between the old growth that is there, and there are two beautiful tulip trees that exist, and new growth that you could put in there, uh, obviously evergreen uh, would, would, would make sense. You could really provide a substantial buffer area that would screen it for pedestrians, for every one of us that drives on Orlando, uh, and uh, certainly the apartment. But the other aspect that I, I do want to bring to your attention is if that driveway was changed, and that's on the right side of that PB1, you would transform this entire development, and you would bring it south, uh, you would keep that row of trees. And the row of trees, just so you see, is, is in that first, on PB2, there's a row of no waste spruces. And I don't want to overstate
state the case. I don't want to say they're magnificent, but they are striking. The apartment complex in that second uh, second photograph, that's what they're looking at now. That will be uh, the walkway is in the third photo, and that will be gone. Now, just, I'll share one other thing with you. That's a, a very often residence, particularly one that neighbors the property. You know, we all, all are concerned about the impact on our property. I really don't feel that way. I, as I said, I really enjoy living in a mixed use community. We selected it. And I will continue to live there and happily, uh, whatever decision we make. I am not sorry that we moved there. Uh, but then, when I looked at Village Hill, and I looked at, I think it's Col Morgan, is that what it was originally? That's a new company. I know it's L. But when I looked at the parking lots that were built, and this was built, obviously, what, 18 months ago? And that's at the bottom of the area. And then I look at the Haskell parking lot, and I just went back with the aerial photos because I, my first impression is it, I mean, it's a horrendous lot. It's, it doesn't have a tree on it. It's just asphalt. But it is isolated. And there's a beautiful windbreak of spruces in the back that at least protect whatever gets built and the, apart and the, and the complexes that are to the north. So at least that's there. And then when I went back with aerials, I found that that was built in 2004. I don't know the auspices. I don't know whether this board approves it, mass development, quite frankly. But what occurred to me is, maybe I'm not so crazy. There, there's a history here of building parking lots that aren't quite suitable for mixed use with residential neighbors. No one in there, no one that I know in the planning industry would ever consider uh, on the Colmorgan lot building residential adjacent to it. And what you're looking here is not dissimilar to it. So let me leave it at that. I, again, I am speaking very reluctantly. Um, I know Jonathan, he's my neighbor. I have great respect for him. And if it's life and death, uh, to the project, I, I actually don't know how I feel. But I do want to express at this point uh, some disappointment in the site plan development, whether it's with you or mass development or Jonathan. I, I think it's somewhat irrelevant. I, I am a little surprised that we got to this point. I first saw these plans two, two weeks ago. If I am remiss in not doing my homework, then by all means, tell me. Uh, but if something was going on for the past three years along these lines, and you didn't, and this, it, it, am I right that this is the first year I've done the site plan approval? So I'll just leave it at that. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you. My name is Nora Albert. I'm Ken Albert's wife and live in that property. And I would like to say that if this will would kill the project, I want to save it. 
and I think it's important for Jonathan to know that and for the planning board to know that. But as I understand it, the changes proposed are modest and should at least be considered. And that's the end of that. trees shown for preservation were are certainly not indicative of um, specimens of trees to take particular care with. Um, I also um, have, now that this project has taken many years um, to build out, um, I don't know if any of you have noticed this going up to the Lynch Hill recently, but many of the trees that were protected during construction on this apartment side, as well as along Village Hill, are struggling because I don't think there was really enough adequate tree protection even for the ones that um, were supposed to be protected. Um, and in fact, the apartment complex, um, the management company called the in the spring and noted, indicated to me that they were taking down features because they were dead and went up there and they absolutely were dead and there were two more that were clearly in major decline that will have to come down. So um, I am skeptical that even if a modified plan were done in order to protect these spruce, that it would actually result in long-term preservation of them. I think they would be impacted by any construction that's on the site. Um, so that's sort of one comment, I think. But the other side of that is, I think the landscape review plan could be beefed up to sort of offset what um, is being taken down. I think there are no trees in the islands here. I will note that one of DPW's comments was the island that's over the infiltration basin should not, um, that care should be taken as to what's planted in that island because of root penetration lower down. But the other islands closer to Olander potentially could be widened or um, a, a tree put in that, so you're, you're breaking up a little bit of that parking lot. It's not a huge parking lot, but still adding landscape, um, adding a tree in the middle of the parking lot might be beneficial, as well as maybe changing some of the landscaping on the, between the lot and Olander. Um, up here, not making a dense, um, you know, I, I, I think I would have to agree that we don't want to wall off projects within village hill development, the idea is integration and not segregation. Um, but, you know, maybe the board can look at something additional in here um, and maybe in this aisle up here. Um, but it would be certainly my recommendation that um, 
plans not be altered without further real analysis from an arborist to determine whether or not such a reorientation of the layout would actually result in a long-term preservation of the tree. What's the minimum amount of parking space that is required for that? In the Plant Village District, um, just in the last, I can't remember how long ago now, <laughs> the rezoning came forward, but zero. Basically, um, parking requirements were eliminated for Plant Village, so the applicant, it was up to the applicant to show what the parking demand would be for a project. And so um, the idea was that there is shared parking in this area and that the, the, develop, the developer, the proponent, would be best be able to make that determination. So there's flexibility, potentially, in the configuration of this if some spaces were lost. Um, that would be something you'd have to ask the applicant. I think the applicant had stated they needed 42 for Fozzie yeah. and then some amount for restaurant and retail. So I don't, I don't know that, um, I don't know the answer to that. You'd have to ask the applicant. I think the flexibility would be in, in lot 19, how, that, how that's developed. And then maybe it's not at, at 10,000 square feet, whatever it's going to be, maybe it doesn't need as many parking spaces that one would think for a typical 10,000 square foot building, but I think they've got a long-term uh, tenant lined up, and that tenant needs 42 spaces, and you're very limited spatially as to where you're going to put those 42, I think. Well, there are 20 additional spaces for the rest of the building, plus the on-street right. parking, uh, but obviously we don't own the on-street parking. There's nobody nearby who, might, who otherwise might use it, but if there's a commercial development across the street at some point, you know, would need to be shared with that. Let's, uh, yeah, keep the public comment coming. Yep. Just a quick thought. Uh, not, not on, I mean, Dick Warren also, uh, Elevator Drive. Second, what Ken said, love the place. I'm sorry, so, your name again? Nick Warren. Yep. Uh, we're at 79 Olander. Um, we've done, um, John has done a phenomenal amount of work here. Um, beautiful. Um, I think there may still be a couple of ways to look at this. I know that Ken uh, was limited, tried to keep the parking by moving it south um, into the part, which it turns out, which I hadn't realized, is actually part of Route 19. We can't actually use it. But there is, to the north of what we're seeing here, there is on the side of, uh, you can't see it here, but on the side of uh, Village Hill Road, there is, in fact, how many parking spaces, Jonathan? There's uh, on the side. The diagonal ones? On the, uh, yeah, diagonal the ones on the uh, right-hand side, there's nine. Yeah. And then there's some other ones over by the uh, uh, DMH. There no, not those. I'm sorry, I don't mean those. Further up, past Olander, oh, yes. there's parking, which could be used by for restaurant people. They would have, have to walk all the 50 feet to get to the restaurant. So I think there may be more parking flexibility than we're seeing if we limit ourselves to this. So my thought is that if it's possible to increase the buffer between the top of this uh, parking lot and Olander um, and move somewhat towards what Ken showed, there actually may be more flexibility in terms of taking care of those lost parking spaces. <clears throat> Anyone else? Comments? I just want to understand maybe from Carolyn or from Jonathan from Mass Development what why I, this um, why the odd configuration why there's a cutout on the bottom I think I understood that it was half because it's soil quality but I don't think I fully understand that why that's a deal breaker to, to remove that piece from 19 or add it on to 18 yeah. yeah I mean what I what I do know is that yeah the only the only good soils that offered any potential of infiltration are in this location right down here to have lot 19 the grade drops off substantially roughly from about where the cursor is down and the soils get really bad so a developing on a building parking lot stormwater storage any of that is a lot more limited than what appears to be just a wide open field on lot 19 part of the potential for lot 19 obviously relies on the ability to store and manage the stormwater effectively depending on how it's configured. So trying to provide all the opportunities and, and opportun uh, availability that we have 
there's a portion of the site here that Lot 19 could use for their stormwater detention that would tie into our system also because there's nowhere else on site that you're going to possibly put a subsurface system. It would have to be above ground and there's no room above groundwater to store it above ground. Nowhere on site 19? No. Okay. No, unless you carve into that hillside, which, you know, we looked at schemes and it's, you know, it's, it changes the landscape dramatically. So prever preserving that last little piece of, um, you know, good stormwater soils is pretty critical to what Lot 19 becomes. I have a thought to suggest if it's a, whatever it's appropriate. Yep. Any other comments on public comments? Okay. Well, it, it's my continuing reaction to hospital hill. If you knew what was going to happen on light 19, right. you'd understand whether there's any buffer room left. But we've done this piece by piece by piece, never being able to see around the next lot story. Well, I, think, I think a lot of the concerns are valid in, in, in the staff report and commented on that. Um, they're all valid concerns, but they're valid concerns for Lot 19. And we yeah. can't make conditions on the Lot 18 on what may or may not happen on Lot 19. Um, at the same time, we can work with what we have and, and beef up the planting at that buffer without making a, a, a wall because we want integration. We don't want little pockets walled off little parking space. Right, and I, I share that same frustration I have for years, um, but we can, I think, at least be anticipatory of how things are going and what this, the abutters plan shows me, and, and I, I hear what Carolyn is saying, is that these trees may not be saveable anyway, and they're not, um, the, the key trees that we're trying to save are not specimen trees, but, you know, it's really clear from the, um, the way it's laid out now is that those trees will absolutely come down. That will be the access points to parking for 19, so I mean, we're, we know, we can, we, we know that that's what's going to happen here, so do we think about that now, and, 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 and think about that in the context of 18, because we know it's going to come down the pipes, which at least in that respect, and I don't, I don't think I have a strong opinion, I just think that we can, we should at least try to be anticipatory when we can, even though I know we have no control over 19 at this point. I, I agree, but at the same time, the the curb cut to get to 19 is in 18, so which is a better condition than say having a curb cut right at 19, where you wouldn't have anything. You'd have a bit, another entrance, you know, 40 feet down from the lot. So right, but the way I think I understand the way it's configured now is that that the access to the other lot would be right where those three trees are. Right. Am I? Yeah. But that. But, that advocate that would allow a buffer to the north of that, right. where if that was the entrance, where you, you could argue that's where an entrance wants to be for, for lot 19, and if that's where an entrance was, then you can't have a buffer. So, yep. Yeah. Can I just make a quick comment about the trees, too, yeah, for, for what it's worth? Um, you know, one speaking to Carolyn's, you know, I, I too have, have been very sympathetic to trying to preserve some of those. You know, we, we've made great efforts to change that base and forward. To, preserve some of the beech trees on the other side. And so the trees that have come down recently, I think in the in the apartment building specifically, are all sugar maples. Most of them are sugar maples, which are, you know, failing all over New England right now. Um, so I don't find it as any great surprise that these are thrown into that same category. Um, there are a couple others, a tulip tree that, you know, we made a great, um, a great effort to preserve, I think, after a week, um, a week after the, um, you know, it, the project finished up, it got struck by lightning. I mean, there's, there's been a handful of things that have happened up there that, you know, despite your best intents, um, it, it doesn't come to fruition. Those Norway maple, or the Norway spruces in that line, particularly where that drive is concerned, one of the issues we looked at those, because there's a couple of hedgerows like that throughout campus. There's one just near the south, uh, near the coach house. There's another one um, over near where the other single family um, development is going. That There's a couple of these old hedgerows of, of Norway spruces. And what's happened is the two end ones typically are in fairly decent shape. The rest of them are all planted 10 or 12 feet on center and are 80 feet, 90 feet tall and really are more of a hazard than anything because the, the wind throw that gets created by them now is, is a real issue. Um, you know, they, they just, you get a little gusty wind and anything that's dead in there and 
75 to 80 percent of what's inside those trees in that hedgerow where you know it's just dead material just gets thrown around and they're not trees that um, you know I think in an open field where they're allowed to fill out as they should um, it's much more appropriate but when they're planted as a hedgerow like that and are you know 70 80 years old there's, there's a public safety issue at hand I really appreciate that and I hope something can be done to protect them and their view. And secondly, uh, this might seem like a very small point, but um, we, our house, the backyard is on the bike trail and they planted viburnums there. And last year they sheared the viburnums. They're like privets. So we have no, first of all, they were just coming into bloom. They're beautiful bushes. They're very nice now. They are completely ugly. And they've done it all over Village Hill. It's just everywhere. Um, so I'm concerned about viburnums being there because, and I talked to the people, two guys with clipboards were in my backyard. And I said, look, last year <coughs> you cut these things down. <coughs> it's not what's supposed to happen. They're not privet hedges. And um, they're... Um, don't provide us any screening at all. So now they're this high, and uh, they are so ugly. So I think <clears throat> the maintenance of uh, plantings needs to be taken into account when they're planted. Now, I know how to take care of our burdens, but whoever does the maintenance up there does not. So those are my two points. Anyone else in the public? Oh, I'm sorry, John. Yep, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, area that uh, Arlene refers to is maintained uh, by Mass Development's landscape contractor. It has nothing to do with this property. Uh, I share those concerns, but I can assure you that uh, Opal has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of square feet of commercial property that they manage to, to very good effect. And uh, I think we have no worries that the landscape will be um, chopped up. So I think that that's a very real concern for her, but not for this property. Um, just was caucusing with mass development to see if there was any way to, and, and the answer I think is no, but uh, if we could move these, these, um, uh, I'm always looking for the middle ground. You know, I've been doing that since I tried to figure out my older brother when I was two, uh, and I'm still doing that. So, you know, if, if we could move lose these two parking places then these could come down and this could open up another eight or nine feet of buffer in here that's an ideal solution i have to replace the parking places you cannot uh, representatives of fazi are here they will they are entitled to 42 spaces i can't leave the uh the rest of the building with 18 spaces it's not it, it, if fazi goes to a long work day there's no place for people to go to the restaurant it's just not tenable can't cut that. I did inquire if there was any way for mass development to, uh, and their representatives are here, Vice President uh, Bill Visco is here, along with Beth Murphy, is any way for them to ease us without going back to their board in December, ease us this space? And the answer is no. So I don't know what else to do. I would love to do that. I would do it in a heartbeat. It would cost me a few thousand dollars in, uh, uh, in site planning, but I, I, I can't offer it because I don't have it to offer. We're on a, on a path to a, an October 9th uh, early entry to this site for the uh, proof rolling and, and soil replacement for a November 1st uh, uh, closing. So we, we have a very tight window. Thank you. I'd like to 
Yes, and as was pointed out earlier, the reason that there's no flexibility in that lot line uh, is secondarily actually a timing issue. First off, it has to do with there's the second subsurface infiltration area for the lot 19 building is going in that site. And that's the only place it can go because that's the last bit of this site. So when we have been working with Jonathan all along, we've always contemplated shared parking and shared drainage in order to make both sites viable. It's very important to the city of Northampton and to everybody familiar with this project that we preserve the commercial potential on this site. And without preserving that drainage potential on lot 19, you can't preserve that, that lot 19 for commercial development. Uh, commercial development is very important to the mixed use character. And so, um, it's very important to us and to, to everyone on this project that that capacity be preserved. Anybody else? If it works. You want to move to uh, close public hearing? I'm going to close public hearing. The biggest thing I issue, I think, is, is well, I for, I for one, I, I think the, this is what we've been waiting for at that corner, is what wants to be there. Um, and I, I think architecturally and, and from a site standpoint, it, it works. It's, it's hard, as you mentioned. Devin, not knowing what's going to hap happen next door, it, but we've been dealing with that uh, all the way through. Well, I think the people that need to hear the message for the next property or here, and I think that's the, this is the time to say that we have taken this piece of property, and I actually really like what you've done with it, but when I look at it, it's it's built, it, it's it's right to the edge of the lot line, it's, it's you know, you've used every inch as you needed to, I, I, I understand that. I know it's not a residential property, but it, it, it wouldn't meet the percentage of open space requirements if it were. And, um, so as we do the next one, we've got an opportunity, not now, but with the next one, to again talk about the screening for the trees, for the, for the housing units around it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what, what we're all anticipating is that that northern corner just comes completely straight out and the rest of it becomes parking lot and there's a long lateral building at the bottom of the hill. So I'm saying that doesn't feel right for that whole combined unit. So while I have been frustrated that we can't talk about it in its entirety, I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm thinking about it. There's going those trees along the top need to need to be there for the next piece of property. So that's um, I, I I ask the developer to do what he can with the end of the property that faces Orlander Drive to try to screen it from the from the residential space, and I think we've got good experience with that happening. So, so a, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of foreshadowing, and yes, it's a very important project. I, I think just uh, just to also clarify that uh, the parking standards for the city, and I mentioned this earlier, but the, the thresholds and requirements for planting and creating strips in the parking lot. Um, increase with the number of parking spaces. This lot by itself doesn't reach the threshold of requiring a, 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 a buffer strip down the parking aisle. So where um, this middle island is where these two bulbs are. But once then you start building the bigger parking lot, um, more than 75 spaces, I think is the threshold, then you have to break the parking up with planted strips. So that will be a the difference too, and I think when you, certainly when you add it all together, it's going to be well over 75 parking spaces. And you know, if it is going to be a medical building of that um, size, then I think it will 
um, get to that threshold as well. So it, it is beneficial, I'm sure, for the um, developer to get the heads up that they're going to be putting in planted islands um, in the parking lot, which help, will help to break that up internally as well as on the edge. Okay. To that point, just to clarify, is that combined parking for, for lot 19? Or is that if lot 19 has 75 parking spaces, then they need to have planted islands? Or if lot 19 has 40, and this has 42, so you're over 75, so then that automatically triggers? Well, there's a minimum requirement, um, but I think given the issues of um, this parking, there's going to be an extended parking area here. It right. seems to me that this is the perfect location to go ahead and extend and create the island and you're parking on the other side of it. Right. Because this is going to become a whole parking lot, so I Mark, think at this point, you know, because you just create because they're using a common curb break. I would argue right. that they that's what I'm saying. Right, right. right. It's, right. it's a yeah. common mm -hmm. curb, but then it's a common parking. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I, mean, I, I think this has the, the potential. I, I, I think we should make the buffer in 18 as as, as good as we can. <coughs> it has the potential the buffer in lot 19. To be worse, or to be a little better, but it also has the potential to be much worse. And so, we can't do anything about that right now, but we need to be aware of it, and the developer needs to be aware of that, so that moving forward, uh, hopefully, we address some of the concerns that were brought up today um, that aren't a surprise to anybody. I mean, we know that they're there. So. What else? Any other comments? So. Uh, do, you to, do you want me to run through some yeah. of the conditions I know that just based on yep. Debbie comments and yep. the other ones? Okay. So, um, prior issuance of building permit revised plan should be submitted that include modifications as required in um, conditions herein. Final plan should be stamped by uh, PD. Um, plan shall um, show and verify that the turning radii has been met for a ladder truck. WD40 um, truck. A clean out in the sewer service is required, should be shown on the plans in the details. Um, uh, the sewer line along Prince Street should be relocated back from the sidewalk so it's not, so it doesn't conflict with the sidewalk. All downspouts connected to the storm drain should be accurately shown on all plans. And uh, references should be corrected as necessary for all drain line materials so they're consistent um, piping as um, specified. Light pole standard should be 16 feet and less shown through photometric analysis. An 18 foot high pole is necessary to cross walk the crosswalk of the lander. Um, and uh, prior to uh, issuance of a building permit um, other than the foundation permit, the following shall be reported the registry D maintenance and access agreement for the shared um, driveway access and the parking lot that should include cross access agreements to allow parties and the public to pass and park um, throughout the shared lot. Um, and an executed stormwater operation maintenance and inspection agreement shall be executed as binding on subsequent landowners um, and recorded as a registry of deeds after approval by DPW. I think, Carolyn, you had mentioned before that there, you did think that there are ways to, um, to improve upon the plantings yeah. inside the lot. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, I was suggesting that um, there could be a, sh a tree at the end island here. There is a 23 foot wide um, drive aisle in this driveway along the curbing there. So I don't, I have to scale off the dimension of this island, but you know, potentially you could, I think a tree could be added here. And then um, I don't, I'm, I think all of these are proposed to stay for now. Probably this is adequate here, but I, I guess, and, and then to the 19, you know, this area could be addressed further. But I think this may be an area where you can add a tree. I don't think this is probably appropriate given its proximity to the yeah. intersection. 
I'd like the board to consider making that a condition. I guess with some caveat that if in fact it turns out not to be possible, obviously. Right. Um, I agree. How do, we, how, do we, how do we make that a condition that makes the color whether it's feasible or not from a design standpoint? Um, well, uh, you could have it so that, they, that if it's not feasible, they need to present data from a, um, you know, a qualified professional to indicate that a shade tree is not, would not work in that location. That, I guess that's where our, we just got through the discussion about that. Sorry, there's, 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 there's a hole light there. I can't put a tree there. Please don't give me a condition that I can't meet. section. I don't know how we make that. We don't want to make a wall for planting. Um, you know, I, for one, I don't really have an issue on the revised drawing with that buffer in that area. Just taking it as a whole for what's going to happen next door. We keep, you know, we keep ending up talking about Block 19 and, and we can't make that a condition. There, that wasn't a planted street tree. It looks like it was a natural tree that came up just about the same <coughs> that one is place. coming. It, it, they have a new tree on the planting plan. suggestion of the can't plant a tree in the middle of the light pole to move to the east and that little nub that sticks in and or is that just trying to force it? Yeah, I think the time to do that is when we deal with the, right. the whole thing. Because then we'll know what the rest of that those trees and the rest of the scape is looking like. Mm -hmm. I, I think the plan is perfectly reasonable as uh, submitted and I think that they leaned over backwards to do everything they can. As a whole, I think it's a, it's a very good plan. It's, it's clean, it's, it's, it's concise, it's just, I think this is just part of the, the program when you're doing piece by piece by piece. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think it's an excellent plan. This is just what we want to see. I am encouraging, encouraging the developer to put the retail in, to put the village in Village Hill. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, I think it could have been a better, it could have been an even better plan if, again, we weren't signing by mass development. In some sense, it's encouraging that we've had the hours discussion over trees and not a word was said about the building. I mean, I think I like the building. It fits the character of the campus. Mm -hmm. It's well done. I, you know, the effort to turn that in and get the other gables front on it is was an expensive design option and, and, it, and it shows that it was worth it. Mm -hmm. 
as, a, as an anchor building, I think it serves the site very well. Like there a motion out there for somebody? to approve the request by New Harmony Properties LLC for site plan approval to construct a 16,000 plus square foot two-story mixed commercial building and associated site development at Village Hill Road, Northampton Map ID 3A-107. Oh, with conditions. Sorry. All in favor? Here we go. Thank you. I would like to open up the hearing scheduled for 8 o'clock. Uh, request by City of Northampton Office of Planning and Development Site Plan for Construction of 40,000 square plus or minus square feet of office space and 20,000 uh, plus or minus control house and related site development the property on Dillon Road, the Lane Construction Site, Northampton Map ID 18 12. Um, before we jump in, you said. Uh, you're going to you can't make a decision. Right, you can't close the hearing on this because DPW has an issue with stormwater permit. So um, I think the goal would be to identify all the issues that you might want to hear in the continuation, and um, and and then continue the hearing ultimately just to focus on the outstanding issues that need to be addressed. And hopefully, uh, you know, I don't know what the timeline would be, but for two weeks and see what happens. I think it would be a good point. 
So the Lane Pipe and Office Planning Development. I'm going to start both Berkshire Design and Ty and Bond, who are consultants to the project, will fill in some of the gaps. I'm going to go through some slides very quickly. The, the other difference, let's say, between a city project and most private projects is we're often trying to meet a lot of different, yeah, different objectives. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, as Carolyn said, we understand you can't issue a permit tonight. We're going to ask for an extension for a month to October 11th, whatever that, that date is, um, to make you happy. But, Please would like to be at 7 o'clock and not at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I am hoping is that we, we believe the only issues left to be done are stormware. So I'm hoping we can knock off all those issues so you can announce to the public that the only thing they'd be doing in October 11th is, is the stormware issues. So very quickly, this is a view if you jump up really high in the air from River Valley Market or just just North River Valley Market. The site in question is right here. So this is the interstate. This is a portion of interstate... Um, the on ramp, uh, ramp, you know, uh, exit 20 that comes on. Um, so Damon Road is just it's a piece of Damon Road here. This is River Run Apartments, which is actually the largest apartment complex we have in the city um, with the worst sidewalk connections of any property. This is the site we're dealing with. It. It's an old, it's, a, it's been a brickyard and then an asphalt batching plant for almost a century. Um, you know, the jargon is it's a brownfield site, a site with a long industrial history where there's either real or perceived contaminated waste. Um, and then there's some woods here. So the, the, the entire site in question is about 23 acres. Actually, this is private, so it's, you know, boundaries are basically river run, um, the city-owned conservation area here, the river, some railroad property, which is about to be acquired by the state, uh, and then up to here. So those are the boundaries. Um, and I'll just show you this one thing quickly in the view. In essence, the mixed use here is we're trying to create a riverfront park, um, which would be half conservation, half recreation, and a business park. And the boundary is basically right here. You can see this um, at a sorting facility. That's basically the boundary. So on the left side of my shaking red line is what the city would be acquiring, and a little bit of land over here, and a relatively small piece of land leading to
All right, so just quickly, and I will race through these slides. Those of you on the planning board know the city adopts every seven years this open space recreation and multi use trail um, plan, and a lot of the objectives cut from that plan are being envisioned here. So the first is the shaded areas, what's called environmental justice areas, areas where the neighborhoods are minor majority minority or majority low income. Uh, and so you see we have relatively few of these these minority majority areas. This is one, and this one is green area, which is majority minority, um, has no parks, other than this area has no parks within it. Um, and so one of the goals in the open space plan is to fill environmental justice, to provide parks for people who don't have it. River Run, as they say, is the largest housing complex in town, but has no access to the park. So this right here is an existing conservation area, uh, Connect River Greenway, we're talking about acquiring this land as a new conservation land, which we, so basically would be pristine, it's about a, it's five acres there, um, and that would be added to this area. So it fulfills the city goal of conservation land that you know, preserves ecologically valuable property. Um, one of the goals of the plan is provide access not just for open space, but open space that meets neighborhood needs. And we're gonna run this area so it doesn't, river runs right on the edge of the river, we wouldn't know it, they don't really aren't connected. And so we're trying to provide them connections. Um, another goal of the open space plan is to provide active recreation. So that's the area in red. So the plan is this land in green would come to the Conservation Commission. This land in red would go to the Northampton Recreation Commission. And this is the land that we developed the land that we did. Um, again, access for the run from that. Um, right, can I go something wrong? Okay. Do we need the arrow? Yes, we do. Um, all right, so then, you know, and, and quickly in terms of open space plan, the goal is to really to not only have land for recreation, but actually develop it. In this case, what we're talking about is um, developing docks, developing access to the water. Um, so, you know, rowing shells and launch from, from the docks. Canoes and kayaks would launch from boat ramp. Eventually, we'd have a bike path that comes all the way down to Damon Road. Um, and eventually, we'd have a boathouse that's over here for non motorized boats. Um, lots of different options. The boathouse hasn't been designed, but just thinking about a boathouse anywhere from, you know, this is the $5 million version to this is the $300,000 version. But, you know, what kind of boathouse do we do that serves a, a range of needs? We have a lot of partners in this project. But Somehow it's going to be serving with those different things. Um, and then this is a long-term vision for a rail trail um, or trail connection of some kind, which would go from where the state rail trail crosses Damon Road, just off here, all the way up to the site, the boathouse site, um, back to the interstate railroad tracks, and then following the railroad tracks all the way up to Elm Court and Hatfield. We are 15 years from seeing this, but this is, you know, a step that moves towards this, and then a really critical step. Um, and then the last thing for the open space plan is one of the goals is to help bring our, our history alive, our heritage. And the New Haven Northampton Canal, which begins at IKEA in, in uh, New Haven, ends right here at the Connecticut River. Um, the only locks in Northampton were on the site, and so we're, we're going to work with Historic Northampton to do interpretive signs for the area and to bring back. So those are sort of the open space and recreation goals. And then the other part of this is the commercial development isn't just about how do we make it pay. It's also a matter of fulfilling other city goals for you know, creating jobs and creating property taxes. And so our estimates are the site could accommodate up to 40,000 square feet. That's what we're asking for approval from you for. Um, but really, we think it's more likely to be 35,000. So we're asking for 40,000 in case we have an end user who, do, who wants it. When you do our own projections, 35,000 is more likely. And just using normal multipliers, that would be 88 jobs, $4 million of private investment in the buildings alone, and $50,000 in taxes. So you know, it serves those different purposes there. Um, and then the last is, is those of you on the planning board for a while know this, but we have strict standards in our zoning about traffic mitigation for projects in residential areas and in most of our business areas but we do not apply those for industrial areas. Because the feeling has always been we need, 
We don't have enough people developing industrial areas. And so it's a free bit. You don't have to provide off-site traffic mitigation if you're developing an industrial area. Coca-Cola, when they expanded recently, helped create the need for a traffic signal industrial drive. But Coca-Cola didn't have to pay for that. Um, but we're still, because we take our responsibility seriously, we are offering to do sidewalks from the project down to Damon Road, even though that's off-site. So we're not required to do any off-site mitigation. We're not offering a blank check. We're offering that much mitigation. Wayne, there's no way to get. A, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no way to get uh, access for the housing community there to get back out to um, King Street extended. So that the railroad and, and the interstate should prevent any way to get so that way. The city has worked, not this one. You, you couldn't go cross country. Right. The city has done a design for reconfiguring Damon Road, which would include bike lanes the entire distance and sidewalks. Um, that's the 25% plans that are going to be announcing public hearing dates in those plans. Okay. So that will include that. But just to be clear, there is no money for that project, so it's beginning a long journey going forward. So that project's a minimum of five years from actually being built. Okay. But it, it is in the queue and everybody gets it's important. And separate from that project, it, it, you can see this in the winter, you go out and look at people walk the winter, you can tell these affinity lines. But you can see paths from River Run all the way to Big Y. And Mass DOT has committed, again, at some point, to build sidewalks from Bridge Road up to Big Y. Okay. If, if, if those of you who have been planning for it for a while, when Big Y was re-permitted, you required sidewalks, orphan sidewalks, that go out to, to North King Street. No one would come at some point. Okay. So, um, and just going quickly on the project, so we're talking about, in essence, three projects. The Conservation Commission, five acres that they're acquiring, um, it's basically going to be undeveloped, no mitigation is required. We're not offering any mitigation because it's undeveloped property. It, may, it would include a future leg, a future leg going up to Hatfield, which would be mitigation, but I can't tell you that's going to happen you know, a long time. The recreation area, which we're talking about, about six acres. Uh, um, this is where the boathouse will be, where access to water. Again, no mitigation is required either for municipal uses or general industrial uses. Um, so they're exempt from mitigation, although we are you doing the sidewalk. And then the lane business park, the land which the lane is retaining, again, is exempt from off-site traffic mitigation requirements under zoning, but that's the area we're going to offer in these sidewalks. And the sidewalks. So these are sort of the, the three components of the project as we go through the, the sites, the site plans themselves. You see this one. Um, when the, the lane project gets built out, and we don't know when that will be, it would be you know, obviously be doing new water and sewer. They'll be donating the land to us. Um, so we're doing the permitting and the planning, and Lane is donating this, this land to us for parks. Um, and they're building sidewalks both on their property and all the way out to Damon Road. All right, so I'm just going to run through the plans very quickly. Um, do you want to interrupt at the points to point out? Let me run through these and then see where your question because given the late hour, Rather than going over everything, sort of under, we spend more time than he wants to spend time on. Um, so, existing site, again, I think the air photo was clear, but you can see on this, this is in essence the cleared area. So, that's the area with the long industrial history. This is wooded, although even the wooded area, there's other areas of impact. So, this was, I don't know the history, but there was a road down to the water at some point. You can see the asphalt. There's certainly, you know, old industrial disturbed area that, that's there. So it's a degraded site. You all have these plans in more detail. A lot of wetlands on the site. Some of these wetlands are jurisdictional under state law, um, and some are jurisdictional only under a local ordinance. And that's reflected. The things under a local ordinance, we have more flexibility about manipulating and moving them around. We hired um, Biodiversity, which is an Amherst firm, and asked them to make sure there were no endangered species before we went down this process. And we looked at uh, Indian burial sites as well. So those that we sort of ruled out as being concerns. Um, so existing conditions again. This is the western part of the site. These are these are out parcels. These are not parcels which lane controls. They may get redeveloped. We're actually hoping that redeveloping lanes property may leverage something to happen those properties, but that's beyond our care. So this is the overall site. This I think mean, my last slide, so I'll come back to this. But in essence, what we're talking about again, this slide is. This land here is the conservation land. It's never developed. This land is 
boat launch, ramps down to the water, future boathouse, and then three commercial pads. Um, there are three areas for 10,000 square foot buildings, one of which could be a, a two-story building, and then parking associated with all those things. So, so we're sort of planning the site together. Um, the development itself will be phased, but we wanted to give you a detailed plan for the entire thing we'll be looking for. So it's more than a concept plan, so it's a full plan. Um, again, I'm just going to raise through these, but um, so this is the city site. So boathouse here, this is the maximum footprint. So this is a 10,000 square foot building. This is if one of the colleges, if Smith College says we want to put a boathouse here. As far as we know, Smith College has no interest in putting a boathouse here. We want, to, we want to show this at its worst case from a traffic standpoint, and, and its biggest case. It's more likely it's going to be a much smaller building. So we're asking for approval for this full size, knowing that if what we're talking about is um, Northampton High School Rowan as the anchor, Northampton Youth and Community Rowan, which is both supports the high school and master's program, possibly Yankee Rowan, which is a sculling program, and a canoe and kayak program. Those are sort of the core, but it would be substantially less than this building, you know, and maybe one of the colleges when it comes to it. So, think about that. so again, that's the core. Um, parking would be over here. A roadway down to the river, which will be closed to the public. You can't go down to the car top of the boat. The roadway is mostly for emergency access, to bring the docks in, to bring a launch in, um, and then for foot access to carry boats in. Um, handicap accessible at this point. This point it gets a little steeper, so there'll be a handicap, a route that goes this way, and that route goes right above the old New Haven and Northampton Canal, so it's also a scenic side route. And then two ways to the river, a ramp to the water, to launch canoes and kayaks, and then a ramp to a dock to launch large, large rowing canoes. And then you see part of this here, you see the next and next view, three out pads, 10,000 square foot footprints um, for commercial development. Those could be, zoom in, they could be um, light industrial or they could be office, but not medical. These are low traffic offices that are always allowed here. There's three pads. Lane Construction has their regional headquarters right now in Pokery Mall. They're planning to move here. So one of the three pads will be Lane Construction. The other two will be on the market, you know, for whoever wants to buy them. Um, again, zoom in the dock. You can see what I was talking about in terms of a longer route down from the water. Um, and then the, the western part of the site, the other two buildings. Um, this is an existing access road here. It's a very odd history. Lane's access, the old brickyard access, used to be from North King Street. When the interstate was built, they lost that access. The state took by eminent domain an easement across River Run's driveway. So they have the right to, to, to cross all the land to get there. So it's off site, it's not owned by Lane, we we'll not be owned by the city, but we have a right to, to cross. So, um, again, you, know, you have a plan, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but zoom ins in terms of. Sidewalks, the entire project, separation of bicycles and pedestrians from cars, future bike path that goes all the way up to Hatfield. Um, you can't see this in the slide, obviously, but uh, lighting, we're assuming no, um, no significant lighting, most of the lighting will be from, from buildings. You can see this here, you can see the image um, And then, same, I'm not going to go through these, same set of slides with the contours and the grading and the drainage. These are the slides where DPW has the most amount of comments. So what we expect to come back to you and send you plans in two weeks and be back before you come up is correcting the drainage issues. So I'm not going to go over them now. We want to correct them. But none of those drainage issues are going to affect where the buildings are laid out, the way the site is laid out. Um, so zoom into that again. We're going to talk about that. DPW's comments were things like, is this um, green garden large enough? And if it's not, there's room to expand it. And are, are we having water or flow down this path so fast we have erosion to the river? Which are legitimate comments, and then we will address those things. Um, and then again, you know, the access road going out here. This one's a little tricky. All that River Run, uh, all that um, Lane owns is a 30 foot right of way that goes out to Damon Road. That's not wide enough for sidewalks. So the offer that we're making on behalf of Lane Construction is. If we can get more right-of-way, we're happy to have them pay for sidewalks. 
but we can't commit to sidewalks if we don't control it. This is similar, again, for those of you who have been on for a while, you've required sidewalks on both North King Street and on Haydenville Road, subject to Mass DOT will the land allow them to have it. This is the same thing. We'd suggest a permit condition which says, if we can acquire the right of way, we have to the sidewalks. We've met with River Run a Condominium Project now four times, twice to the board, once for a walking tour, and once with a neighborhood group. And frankly, they're split. You know, we've said we're happy to the sidewalks if you want them. Um, some of them don't don't want the sidewalks, and and that's their internal politics. Right? You know, we want to make the offer that we're happy to pay for them if they will to give us the, the land. And then I'm going to go through this unless there's questions. Actually, I'll let Berkshire answer the questions. But, you know, the details are here, and Berkshire can answer these questions. So then I'm going to ask Paul from Time Bond to talk about traffic because he knows this, and I have no idea. So I'd like to um, introduce myself, Paul Fergal, Time Bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Fergal, Time Bond. We conducted a traffic study at this site for a 40,000 square foot development. Um, plus a boathouse, as, as Wayne has identified. As part of our effort, we collected data back in the month of June, um, early part of June, where um, historically June has been a higher than average uh, traffic condition month in the city of Northampton. So we have data that suggests this. We then took this data and we projected it to a five-year um, development Year, assuming that the facility would be fully developed, we increased the numbers on Damon Road to account for a 1% growth. And we also <laughs> once we generated um, the site generated traffic based on uh, institute transportation ITE average rates, we, we took those vo volumes and we added them to the background, or known as mobile, as you can see in the uh, traffic report. From them, we calculated uh, the build condition volumes and we analyzed what the before and after traffic conditions were. Bottom line is that this proposed facility. going to generate about 94 trips in the morning, of which you're going to see 79 trips coming in. That's associated with the office development, as you can see right here. Um, there's going to be about 11 trips leaving the site associated with the office. Also, if you look in this row here, this is the summary of what the boathouse is estimated to generate. You can see it's a small volume. The overall site ge generation is about 94 trips in the morning. Now, going over the PM, it's a little different. Obviously, people are leaving work after uh, you know, around 4 or 5 o'clock. You, you will see a lot more trips leaving the site. So in this case, we have about 21 vehicles coming in and about 103 vehicles leaving. Um, as well as this three-in-one uh, distribution for the boathouse. Um, once we added that to the no bill, we got the bill, as I said previously. We then assessed what the level of service would be. Well, in this column here, you see the existing 2012 conditions here. Um, as you can see, Damon Road eastbound will operate as an A, and the southbound, which is the, the Lane Plant Road, will exit out of D. We then projected those existing volumes to, to the uh, 2017 no bill, uh, which is just takes account without the development taking place. As you can see, the delay goes up a bit. We then added the site generated volumes, and we have this condition with a love service half leaving the site. Now, the proposed 2017 build without mitigation assumes that there's only one lane leaving Lane Plant Road. 
uh, with the proposed mitigation approach, what we suggest is having a left and right turn uh, lane. So two lanes, exclusive lanes, one, one to take a left, one to take a right. With that mitigation effort, as you can see, you de decrease the um, delay associated with, with that extra lane. Now these, these uh, values here are assessed for the morning uh, condition. Down here, this is the PM condition. As you can see, it's a little different. Um, typically in the afternoon, you see a lot more. Can I just ask a question on, on just a clarification? Adding an extra lane, do we have the footage to do that? or? It... Right now, it sort of operates as, as two lanes. There was enough, I mean, there's enough width out there. Um, there might be some minor uh, modifications necessary to the roadway width to accommodate that. We've been told by tenants from River Run that practically that, that people are friendly enough and people understand the problem so that they make space even as it's mapped. Even though it's not lined, it may not be quite wide enough. People squeeze in, so that but if it becomes a formal road with DPW, except that people are going to be nice to each other, and even though it's not as wide as it should be, it's a two-lane. So that's the reason for the negation. Is that would be striped and marked so that it's more formal. But even still, okay. But I, I hear three ten-foot lanes. You've got two turning and one coming in. Okay. I just, I just want to clarify. I I live here now in. The, the euphoria that people are presenting is not accurate. It, there isn't room for three lanes here right now, and people struggle in and out every day. And, and these numbers really blow my mind. And you've got 80, you're projecting 88 jobs, you've got to be projecting more than 79 in. So I'll just leave it at that. So wait my turn. So jumping to the afternoon. Uh, peak hour conditions, where as you can see, we did the same breakdown of the existing, the no build, uh, the build, and the mitigation numbers. Uh, not to bore you with all the numbers here, as you can see, there's a bit of a jump with delay associated with adding traffic. Um, if, if we were to add that additional lane, as you can see, there's a substantial uh, improvement in the um, level of circle, I should say, in the delay uh, leaving Lane Plant Road. Yeah. I'd just like to state something for correction. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, can you just hold your comments till we get to the All right. This is uh, a traffic volume diagram showing what the it's kind of difficult to read in this in this projection, but um, we just have the 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 addition of traffic volumes from an existing to a uh, no build and then to what the site generation is associated with this proposed development. Um, as you can see, we distributed the traffic volumes associated with the proposed development. In the morning, which is important to note, you can see that the traffic associated with the 40,000 um, square foot office development there's really not a lot of traffic leaving. There's only 12 vehicles leaving associated with this development, which is which is the best scenario that you can have with the River Run condominium um, traffic leaving in the morning. Because typically with these residential units, that's when you see the most traffic is in the morning. People are leaving, they're going to work. So it's not really going to add that much more delay in the morning with respect to this um, uh, proposed office. Now, in the afternoon, it's a different story. Obviously, people are leaving work. Um, we're projecting, based on ITE rates, as mentioned previously, um, there's going to be about 104 different uh, or 104 additional vehicles leaving the site, and we split it based on um, the demand on Damon Road. We then, as I mentioned before, we added those volumes um, to the no build, and we got the build, and these are what the projected. Um, future volumes are based on a design year of 2017. Uh, it's difficult to see here, but I believe that's... So in the morning we have about uh, 30 vehicles taking left, 45 taking a right. Um, in the afternoon we have about 73 taking a left and 77 taking a right.
bottom line is that I know there's, there's, there's concern about traffic. Uh, Dayton Road tends to be busy uh, throughout the day. And the one thing that this, this development does is, is it's a bit offset in terms of its peak volumes. As they leave the site, they leave in the afternoon when most people are coming into that development. So there's, there's that benefit to this development that it's not going to generate that same amount of uh, peak flow leaving the site as it would um, if they were the same or similar use. Um, the other point to make out of traffic that is not to be underestimated is if you go out today, you're going to look at a site where lane is gated and nothing's going on. But lane is an, an active operation. Their grandfather has been actively marketing it. So they could open up tomorrow as with, full, you know, with a lot more truck traffic. So even though we're talking about obviously a lot more cars than was there before, we're talking about a lot less trucks. So lane is grandfather. They have the right to continue making concrete batch and the right to store tractor trailers there. In essence, for them to reopen their operation, they would require no permits whatsoever. They could just come back and do it. So, so part of the issue of comparison isn't, don't compare the existing conditions now, what we're talking about, compare what Lane was before or what they have the right to be. Okay. Um, the only other thing I have to present to you is we have the DPW comments. I want to go through them and sort of give our response and how we've addressed them. I don't know if you want me to do that now or if you want to take a public comment first. Um, is that for the presentation? Is Berkshire going to have anything? Berkshire is going to help when we get to, to going through the DW content. Okay. Any um, comments from the board before we hear the public has to say? No? Okay. Yeah, I like I'll wait. Boys. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll jump into the public comment. If uh, you could raise your hand, and again, when you come up to the podium, just uh, give me give us your name and your address, and uh, we'll go from there. Who would like to speak first? Yep. Hello, I'm Tim O'Donnell. I'm a resident and unit owner at River Run, which is 80 Damon Road. I just want to state emphatically, there is nothing called Lane Road. I want to state that. I want you guys to think it's a road. It's not. It's our driveway. All right. I just want to emphasize that. Some people call it Water Street. It is no. There is no Water Street. There is no Lane Road. So you know. I mean, call it. Call it what it is. Call it River Runs Driveway. Um, I'm also a River Run board member. Um, use of the River Run Driveway to access the new and improved lane construction. Site, it, ra it raises many concerns, and, and we have discussed this at River Run. Wayne's been out. I went for the walk with him. We got poison ivy. We have, you know, a lot of us, you know, see, you know, positives. But, um, and, and I'll just state this: River Run's not split on this. You know, people are very concerned there about uh, what this will bring. Uh, and I'll make a few. I'll suggest a few of the items that have been discussed. Um, the increased traffic on our driveway. The increased traffic upon entering and exiting uh, River Run, getting on and off of Damon Road. Yeah, it's great that the people will be leaving while we're coming in, but it's the same time. It's, it, it, it's already absolute chaos there. I don't know how many folks have been there and tried to come in or go out. But taking a right isn't so bad because, yeah, you usually wait, you hold up, and someone lets you out. Taking a left, I'm surprised we don't have more car accidents because it's frequent. You see skid marks, people are pulling out and, and uh, yeah, even though people climb up on the grass to do their best, but um, it, it's, it's not, it's not um, any way accommodating the traffic that we present, never mind adding 88 jobs plus customers plus delivery trucks, you know, and whatever else you might have there. Uh, we're concerned about the increased potential for unauthorized persons who will be accessing River Run property. I mean, we've had, we've had, uh, Problems with people who like to live out on the river. Northampton PD had to come out last year. We had guys bashing, getting his head bashed with a baseball bat. People stealing stuff off of our porches. You know, um, we love the bears that walk around, but we definitely don't uh, look forward to attracting more uh, unauthorized or undesirable people onto our property. Um, the de decreased safety for pedestrians on River Runs Driveway. 
uh, River Run is 216 units with a very diverse population, you know, all ethnicities, etc. But what I want to point out is we have many kids, we have many special needs, adult and younger, that wander around the property, walk on our driveway. That's where people walk their dogs because we don't want them doing it on our property, so they go out to our driveway. They do it out there. And there's a lot of elderly that live there and like to walk and have some sense of safety walking around. Uh, the safety and the ability to use our drive will be negatively impacted. Uh, just so you, just to let you know, River Run recently spent 50000 plus to redo our driveway. Just our driveway, never mind the 200 and some odd plus thousand we paid to redo our parking lots. Um, and uh, as Wayne knows, because I made a point of it when we were together at our, at our, uh, at our meeting, we asked Lane, you know, who in using that right away to help us out and get a nickel. So just a little trivia. Uh, in closing, let me share one last item, and then there'll be some other comments I wrote after listening to the presentation. Um, unfortunately, I foresee personal injury accidents involving parents of rowers or teenagers racing to get to their, you know, practice or their meet, or customers racing down the River Run's driveway to make um, the, the uh, the office before it closes or so they're not late for work or to make that purchase or or, or the delivery trucks racing in there um, you know to do their business uh, you know you know what Wayne presented tonight is much more developed than we saw uh, at, at our open house right Wayne uh, that wasn't that wasn't the board meeting that was the uh, right. You know, a little community right. thing. That's we'll head on. Plans, yeah, hadn't we haven't seen those yet, and I'll tell you, I find them more troubling. Um, you know, we hear now talk about oh, we're going to make a park, we're going to have recreation, and you know, which is different than the very limited use of is for a rowing team. That's all it's going to be there. It's not going to be for uh, you know public use to bring their boats in or canoes or whatever. Um, so, you know, seeing it more develop uh, was surprising and, and, uh, and, and more concerning. Um, you know, sidewalks on our driveway certainly aren't sufficient to make up for what we'll be losing in safety, privacy, security. Um, you know, as we are right now, we really don't need sidewalks. Not that it would be bad to have them. And I, I personally wouldn't want to see us lose our, our lawn in front of building, building one there uh, to increase the road because it's to, to increase our driveway because it's not wide enough for two lanes legally because uh, it's only a driveway. Uh, so we really wouldn't want to lose our space. I mean, push comes to shove, and I know we're going to be the ones who are being pushed. Uh, you know, take the fence, move the fence close to 91 and, and you know, take the state space if you have to do that. But, uh, um, you know, certainly not a sufficient compensation for, for all that we're going to be undergoing. I, I noticed that you said no lights. I mean, isn't there going to be any security down here, you know, if, if we do do this? It's going to be a, an attractive place to go and hang out. I know when I was a teen, it the kind of places we liked, and I'm sure the rest of you did too. Um, you know, the numbers for the uh, traffic study, you know, numbers are something, but, you know, bottom line, when you say we're going to create 88 jobs, I, unless people are serious carpools, and we know most of us aren't, you know, we're looking at probably 88 cars just there. Never mind your customers. You know, Lane doesn't work in a vacuum. We have people in and out. These other um, offices, these other buildings they're talking about, we've been assured they won't be storefronts, but people still have traffic that comes in and out. So, um, you know, uh, I did want to emphasize the Lane Plant Road. Um, you know, the bottom line is more cars. The bottom line is going to be more cars driving fastly down River Run's driveway. Um, uh, you know, I was there when Lane still was operating, and I live, you know, right there by the woods. Never bothered me any. Their trucks never bothered, you know, in my opinion, would never bother. You know, they weren't hundreds of them every day. Um, they were respectful and drove slowly. Um, so. If they want to open their plant back up, uh, you know, that, that, when it, uh, that doesn't uh, um, change my opinion. Um, so, I thank you for your time.
Anyone else uh, would like to speak about this project? Mark a lot. Uh, I'm not a Northampton resident, but I'm from Hatfield Open Space Committee. Uh, and uh, as part of the Hatfield Open Space and Recreation Plan, we've uh, uh, been working with uh, the planning department uh, for a while on the, the link from Hatfield to Northampton uh, along the river. And uh, I am happy to see that. that the beginnings of that link is at least planned out in this uh, in this development. Um, we've been working on the other end of the trail, uh, and the Hatfield Community Preservation Committee, uh, along with the Board of Selectmen, have already started the process of, uh, of uh, doing some surveying along with the City of Northampton for the possible link of this trail to Hatfield and Elm. I can't really comment on the industrial portion of this, but I think the recreational part of it is very interesting. Uh, and from Hatfield resident point of view and open space committee, uh, I think it's a very interesting project to make uh, a recreational component and kind of a locus here uh, as a destination uh, for people coming from Hatfield uh, and also Northamptonites uh, heading up the river uh, into Hatfield. So, I know that this is a long way in the future, but it, it's a very interesting project, and uh, I'm glad to see that it's, it's making progress. I think the connection, as a commuting connection to Hatfield, is great. Uh, and when the trail is built, I think the river views and the recreational aspect of it are really stunning. So, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll support that. Uh, I'm glad to see it. Good evening. I'm Phil Bleski, the president of Northampton Youth and Community Rowing. And I do appreciate and I do hope that we can mitigate the traffic concerns from River Run because as a member of the rowing community, the ability to access the Connecticut River is exciting. It's a shame that we here in Northampton have so much miles of riverfront access but really have limited ways to, to get to it. What this site will allow us the potential to build a facility to allow non-powered boats to access the river and then continue the whole process of the whole blue wave. And without this, we're limited to right now using the Oxbow, which is for other reasons, although it's available, during the springtime that road is flooded, it's also a dirt road, and it's also other safety concerns. Having access here will enable more people access to the river to do non-powered boat activities. My own son, for example, just finished four years, or actually five years of rowing, and was able to get to the college of his choice because of rowing. So I'm very appreciative of what rowing has to offer. This year we've increased the amount of youth rowing by almost 30% over last year because of the access that we, the limited access we do have. And we've also doubled the amount of master's rowers, not to mention the Yankee rowers across the river. People are looking for the ability to get to the river. And I hope that we can, the board and Wayne, can figure out a way to mitigate the traffic concerns, the valid traffic concerns of River Run, so we can have the ability to access this natural asset that's right on the front, front step but we can't get to it right now. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mary Likens. I'm an erstwhile tenant of River One. I now live in Hatfield. I'm very excited to know that there could be potentially a link between Northampton and Hatfield in the near future. I think that the rowing possibilities and our access to the river are really um, astoundingly um, a potential beautiful thing for us to have, especially as an erstwhile tenant for four years at River Run. I enjoyed going down to the river and taking walks. 
my son enjoyed being at the river and using the tree swing that's available down beneath the farmlands. I often wondered what I thought was a creek, and now I know from Wayne's knowledge that it's an old canal. So that's great, and the potential that we have to bring more people into the community to enjoy the wonderful riverfront, I think, um, offers us some great opportunities. My concern, as it was brought up many times to my Ward 1 representative when I was a resident of Northampton, are the safety concerns that we have for people who live in River Run. As is known, River Run is a very large housing community, and it's very diverse. It's diverse ethnically, and it's diverse um, income-wise. Subsequently, there's a lot of foot traffic, and um, with the link that will be happening between Northampton and Hatfield, and then the Noratuck link that happens currently, there is no link now to connect what will happen between River Run and the other bike paths, except to cross Damon Road on foot, that is absent of all sidewalks. I know that the Interchange 19 potential might bring some sidewalks that might not. I know with some of the zoning changes that are happening, we're looking at increasing foot traffic into Northampton, or we might not. Um, I know that we really want to create a small, walkable, head-powered community, and we seem to appreciate that in some regions of Northampton, um, but we don't seem to appreciate it in housing community regions of Northampton. So it's a big concern. I'm also a little flabbergasted by the um, traffic numbers that were brought forth from a hired person here from a, um, for the town. As Tim mentioned, um, we have people who uh, leave for work every day at River Run. We have students who go to school every day at River Run. And we have college students who come and go from River Run. The traffic numbers, I, I, I don't understand them unless he did them on a Sunday from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning to get such low figures and to do them on a Sunday from 4.30 to 5.30 to get such low figures. Otherwise, I, I, I'm very confused by them. I'm also, again, going to voice my concern that there aren't any sidewalks. And if we're going to really promote having a housing area that doesn't have a park, but not have any availability for foot traffic or bicycles, becomes a new, great, shining example um, of what Northampton can do when it comes together. I, again, am very concerned. It sounds like we're piecemealing a project together, just as we did with Lot 18 up at Village Hill and piecemealing it. Um, I, I'm very concerned by that. So thank you very much. Anybody else? Questions here. I just have one additional question. It seems like six to seven hundred feet is a long way to walk with a boat on your shoulder. How does, is, is that a long, I'm not a rower. But it's about 250 feet or 300 feet. Oh, okay. That's all it is. <laughs> no, I guess apparently not, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's a long way to walk anyway. I was going off the scale on thing. Yeah, it seems like a free football field by the time you get there, you're brown because you're tired. <laughs> um, but great exercise. Yeah, yeah. Be healthy before you're brown. So. And then might you float cars. It just seems like physically a long way to go. But I'm sorry. Um, any comments from anybody before we hear about PPW? Yeah, it's too far. <laughs> okay. Yeah, really. <laughs> Yeah, the walk there is bad. Walk back and forth. Okay. All right. So, I, and I think you all know this is a site plan approval application, not not a special permit application. So the use itself isn't what we're asking you to approve because it's allowed by right. It's really just sort of the details. So that's why the DTLB memo is so long, and that's why I spent a little bit of time going through this because the details that matter. So I, I pass this out to you. So um, I'm just going to race this quickly to highlight the major things. Um, all the stormwater comments DBW has, I'm not going to address because that's where we're going to come and, and focus when we come back, hopefully in October, before you guys. Um, 
thresholds for, for MEPA, we, we are below the thresholds. That means we don't need to get a MEPA state permit. We are routinely, when we do, we do a project below MEPA thresholds. We, at MEPA, we do what's called an advisory opinion. So we're writing MEPA to say, do you concur that we don't need a permit? We don't have that back yet, but we don't believe we exist. Um, uh, they mentioned lots of resource areas. Yes, there's lots of resource areas, which we hired so many consultants for this, this project. Um, I'm hoping we go before the planning board the same night as you guys uh, as well. Um, but we're still aware of the resource areas and that they've been part of the planning process. Um, the plans aren't stamped, and they will be stamped when, with the final plans. There's a series of comments that's going to shortcut you. You don't have to, have to go through every single comment here. There's a series of comments early in the process when we were exploring all the options. We had the first meeting with River Run, and River Run gave the same comment you heard tonight about that they've been sort of ripped off over the years, and I don't disagree with that, about that they pay the cost of the road and other users don't have to pay the cost. And so we explored the option of did it make sense for that to become a public road? Instead of being a River Run access road, being a public road, um, went back to the trustees, said, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And the answer basically we heard was, no, not the meeting. We said, fine, if you change your mind, let us know. So we're not planning this as a public road. So all the comments in here about public roads, all the comments about subdivision standards don't apply. That's not the route that we're going. So do you remember these conversations four months ago when we were exploring that? So this would remain private driveways, usable for the people who live there, the people who work there. As well. That covers a lot. The, um, the site plan itself, um, this is, we're not just doing this as a conceptual plan. This is a full plan showing where buildings could be on the lane construction site. They obviously don't have buyers, and so if they came back later and changed the location, then they have to come back before you for a main site plan. We, these work, and frankly, given the wetlands on the sites, there's not a lot of flexibility. It's not like you totally redo the site. So, you know, any site plan obviously could be amended if you approve it, but it's probably going to, the final development is going to be pretty close to this. There will be a series of comments later until the water and sewer lines get formed, go to construction drawings. Some things, some technical things aren't shown in these plans. These are permit level plans, we, so we don't have, we're not showing the existing utilities for River Run, those kinds of things. Those show up at construction drawings. Um, Certainly, the detailed utility plans have to be, you know, any water line, any sewer line has to be approved by DPW. So, when we get to those phases, that's what we need to um, The comment about Mass DOT has a, the city does the, the drawings for reconstructing Damon Road. Um, Mass DOT has accepted those drawings and are advancing them to the public hearing. Um, so, some comments about reflecting what's on those new plans on, on this work. Um, you know, that sort of off-site work is easy enough to show if we have them, but it's not that, it's not really relevant to the project. It's beyond the scope of the project. Because again, the only thing that we're responsible for is internal to the site, not off-site. Um, second page, the top question was just the status of the right-of-way. I've included in the right column just the formal, where the right-of-way is. So Matt, when Mass DOT took by eminent domain this 30-foot right-of-way and gave it to Lane or to, to Lane's predecessors. That gave them the right to cross these two different properties. So there's a citation there that Duke was asking for where's the right um, And then there's, a, there's an odd section um, with maybe more detail than you want, but on the plans, you notice the thing which says 20-foot right-of-way, which is right here. Um, that's actually owned by the city. It's a very bizarre thing. It's a 20-foot right-of-way for drainage, although the canal actually isn't always in the 20 feet. The canal winds back and forth. So if somebody took by eminent domain 50 years ago or 100 years ago, apparently the wrong thing. They took some of the drainage and some things that weren't. I don't, I don't know the history. But you know, our surveyors picked up the right-of-way line is taken by eminent domain, which is partially includes the canal, partially doesn't. So it's as I say, the, the existing water lines and sewer lines would be shown as part of when we get to construction drawings as well. Um, then under this layout section, 
most of the comments from DPW aren't applicable because they have to do with this, again, is this a subdivision? It's not a subdivision. Um, the next comment I'll ask you guys to address is just the uh, turning radius of where the fire trucks and trailers can make up. You did. Yeah, we did do a turning analysis um, of the sites. That was one of the earlier concerns, um, both for emergency vehicles, but also for um, you know trailers and, uh, and skulls and those types of things. So we did do a full turning analysis on the site to make sure that um, you know that, that it was accessible by all those the curves where um, it was tight. There are mountable um, you know concrete or uh, big con firms, um, so it's, it's not prohibitive that you know some of the trailers do have made drag over a curb, but in most cases there's there's access throughout the site. Okay. Jeff Squire from Berkshire Design. Yeah. <laughs> um, so design standards which apply to subdivisions um, call for uh, cement concrete instead of bituminous. If the board wants cement concrete, we we'll accept that as a condition. Obviously it's not our preference, but we accept that as a condition. Likewise granite curbs are fine, they have to be mountable in those spots that Jeff mentioned. But, um, proposed sidewalks is just a comment on having a crosswalk right at this point. Because for some reason, Mass DOT is only showing sidewalks up to this point. Um, and so the question is would we do a crosswalk here? Yes. I mean, frankly, you know, a little editorializing. I think it's pretty outrageous that River Runs never had sidewalks and that Mass DOT's sidewalks are only coming this far. They should actually come go in this direction. So on behalf of the planning office, we're going to log at Damon Road to get more sidewalks. But if they don't go in, then yes, a crosswalk here is so easy. Can you clarify that? So um, the 25% design shows from King Street to that western edge. Is that what the... On the north side of the road. On the south side of the road, the sidewalks um, the entire distance down to Green Street. And so the crosswalk would be across the driveway, not Just across the driveway. Right, right, right. Yeah, it would be yeah, unsafe yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah. So just a tiny crosswalk. I mean, again, you know, my argument is just, I think we should be running sidewalks all the way up to those homes that are right here on that side of the street. You know, Massachusetts has a policy, a state policy, which isn't always followed, which says bicycles and bass streets should feel comfortable walking and bicycling on every surface street in the Commonwealth. And so if we're rebuilding Damon Road, we should be extending sidewalks on that side of the street. But, you know, if they don't, yes, we can put the crosswalk there. Again, if we ever run gives us a right away for the sidewalk to get that. Um, so then just a comment about the turning. You know, Paul mentioned as mitigation, you know, widening the road a little bit or the driveway a little bit is necessary. So we can do a turning lane there to formalize the lane. Um, DPW's comments just, you know, coordination with the state 25% plans, which yes, we're certainly would do. Um, there was a question so there are a few things which we disagree in terms of utilities. I won't go through those. These are minor things in terms of separation. Um, so we can address those. Um, there's a, there was a question from DPW's memos I didn't quite understand asking, was a single hydrant adequate for this area? And the answer is we put only one in because our engineers think a single is adequate. If DPW is formally saying they want two, we put two in, but they didn't actually say that. Um, so we were addressing that. Um, proposed buildings to be sprinkled, that we don't know because it will depend on the exact final size of the buildings, but obviously to get a building permit we need to you know, state department to um, so Again, some technical things I won't go over, you know, in terms of bins. Um, uh, one of the comments from DPW is they prefer not to have an open trench when you dig into Damon Road for connecting utilities, just because that messes up traffic. Doing directional drilling is much, much more expensive. Obviously, our preference is open trench, but we need to get a trench permit. So if we get a trench permit for open trench, that's what we do. If they said, no, you can't do that, you have to do directional drilling, then that's what we do. So you know, they have the right to do whatever they want to do, and, and we will follow that at that point. But it doesn't, it doesn't need to be addressed at this stage, because mm -hmm. it's their road. Yeah. Um, so, series of questions about the traffic, which I think Paul addressed most of. Them. <coughs> sure. The first question uh, is, is requesting that we do a 10-year projection um, to mimic the 
Damon Road reconstruction project. Um, given the fact that that project used a 10 year projection, we did a five. Industry standard for a typical traffic study uh, statewide, actually national, is, is typically a five year uh, projection is what we did. But one thing to note is that our volumes, uh, in comparison to the Damon Road construction uh, project, their projections, our numbers are relatively close to what they've um, projected for future design uh, volumes along that second. So uh, we don't think it's going to be a, uh, much of a change uh, with respect to um, updating our numbers. The second uh, question is, or comment is, the redevelopment of the former Cole Morgan site, in which um, the study didn't account for that site because there isn't enough data to really understand what the proposed dealership's going to be. Uh, we need a little bit more technical data to understand um, the size and, and, and um, how many bays and things of that nature this facility is going to have in order for us to estimate what traffic uh, volumes um, are going to be generated as a result of this new uh, dealership. The third question deals with the uh, future signal at the intersection of Industrial Drive and Damon Road. Uh, the question is how, how will the future queuing um, impact any potential um, activity at that, uh, at that route run access? Well, the, the point that I stress is that any future um, design development of, of the David Road project should be coordinated with this with this roadway because if there are certain things, and as, as uh, Wayne has stated, for example, the uh, two lanes that are departing from the Lane Plain Road, we should that that should be included on the design plans because that's something that um, should be included to improve the site. Also, the other thing which I'm going to talk about is the signal. Uh, there was a question about that, uh, question five, but I'll, I'll discuss that um, after I discuss four. Is uh, why isn't there any um, level of service analysis for the westbound approach? Well, the westbound approach isn't going to be stopped because uh, any vehicles that are traveling westbound and want to access the site, they'll be taking a right hand turn, which doesn't stop them, they just slow down a little bit and continue. So it doesn't assess any level of service. In essence, it's a level of service A provided it's not uh, impacted by other conditions. Question five, um, it, it, you know, we recognize that the level of service is poor at that, at that location. Um, the one thing that we did was we had a preliminary traffic signal war analysis using the manual on uniform traffic control devices standards. Um, it's a federal guideline that identifies nine different warrants um, to install a traffic signal. We went through the ones that we could uh, find applicable. Um, it, it, it meets only one warrant, which is the peak hour warrant. Um, and lack of a better way of explaining uh, this warrant that it's met, it, 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 it's, it states basically that there's a certain volume that's on the major street as well as on a minor street, being the Lane Plant Road. Um, the delay associated for that one hour is so uh, large that it would warrant a signal. But the way that the MUTCD is written, the manual states, is that one of these uh, warrants doesn't satisfy in itself um, a signal, meaning that an engineering study would have to be uh, prepared at a later date, or in our opinion, at a later date, um, an engineering study should be prepared to assess what the real volumes are once the development is fully operational. So once there's 40,000 square feet of development and the boathouse is operational, um, it would be a good idea to do a traffic warrant analysis to understand exactly uh, what the existing conditions have. Because based on today's volumes and the projections of, of, of these volumes, it doesn't necessarily meet um, the first two warrants, which is we have the other memo that we prepared, but uh, warrant one, which is the eight-hour warrant, and warrant two, which is the four-hour warrant, it doesn't meet those big warrants, which as, as traffic engineers, we, we look at those two warrants and it's sort of the um, rule of thumb, if, if, if you really need one, um, to, to explain it in um, simple terms. But point being, any future work should be coordinated with the Damon Road project, as well as um, 
revisiting the site once it's active to see what the volumes are and what the demands are to make sure that you know it's running efficient. So, um, um, so I think I basically went through all the comments. So. Um, do you can I read out anything that you want to address? So you typically do a traffic analysis by, by looking at the traffic generated by the project you're running. So you're looking at an internal uh, analysis, but you're using a private road. So if you've got 219 units on that road, that ought to be in the analysis. So you can't just take the ITE codes for your industrial building and the ITE codes for a boathouse. I, I bet there are two that constitute the average. It's a very limited number. So. I'm doubtful that one in three is a really good number for a boathouse. Uh, um, I know how they're generated. I mean, you you, right. you poll and, and people give you numbers and you do averages. Okay. Um, but what I'm looking at is I'm 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 bothered by the the private road coming in and I'm 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 really wanting you to fix that. I'm wanting you to go back to the trustees and say we can we can do something different about that road. And I think the project would really kind of breeze on through. But it's it's a traffic problem. And, and it's going to be, and it's, you know, it, it's not to be casual about all Fs for a traffic study. I guess I, the part I'm trying to stress is the city has made a philosophical decision as to what we're willing to, as we as taxpayers are willing to subsidize to encourage film. So Coca-Cola, the first plant was, you know, the industrial drive hit the warrant for a signal 15 years ago. When Coca-Cola came in, they basically, I don't mean this in a bad way, but they broke that intersection. They brought it, if it's not level service F, it's close. Right. They had no obligation to fix it. When this board approved Coca-Cola's expansion, which is two years ago, which breaks the signal more, they have no obligation. Because we collectively, the community, have said development in general industrial doesn't have to provide this thing. So I, I'm understanding what you're saying. And if this site was highway business, absolutely they have to fix it. But ultimately, this board, frankly, recommended the city council the current zoning, and the city council adopted the current zoning. And it's very clear it's not our obligation. But I don't think sidewalks along a private road are solving much of the problem of all of the vehicle traffic that's going to go in and out. Right. So that I mean, that's why, in essence, we have, for Coca-Cola and for Damon Road, we're going through this process of 25% design and, and redesigning Damon Road. Game Road itself, the, the process is underway, will have some changes that will make it a little bit better. You know, we're getting a signal industrial drive next year that's going to create a, a green wave as it's gaps in traffic that goes through here. Um, but I, I think our position is, I'm not disagreeing with you, but if this intersection should be signalized, that should be done as part of the Damon Road reconstruction. Well, I guess I'm not even looking at the MUTCD warrants. I'm more thinking that this is just a really poor traffic study. That, that it, it says, oh no, I can't do the right-hand turns. Well, there's times when that completely backs up from the light. There could there could very well be timed delay in that right-hand turn into the, the area. Um, and I just think there ought to be some thought given to the combined traffic. It, it's not out on King Street. It's down what? Uh, it, it's a private road. Is that? So. Does that not become a funnel for all the traffic? So doesn't the residential traffic need to be in the traffic study? Uh, oh, the, the residential traffic is in the study. Um, I'm not sure. So the figure... look at figure two, which is essentially this uh, this presentation cut out, as you can see, snippets from it. Figure two represents volumes that were taking, uh, taken during the morning peak hour uh, as well as the afternoon peak hour. And these volumes here that are there, as you can see, um, 
those include the uh, River Run condo uh, traffic in there. So uh, right now, uh, as you can see, in the morning there's about 22 cars taking a left and about 38 taking a right. That's actual numbers that we counted. So it's it, it's something that we recorded over a two-hour period, and over that two-hour period we picked out the one hour that demonstrates that peak uh, flash condition. Okay, well, you're so, right. I was looking at table two, but. So the table two was a summary of the future edition as, as a result of this project. So we did um, include the uh, condo project, or the condo existing conditions in the assessment. Okay. And my last comment is it seems odd to me that we would have the lowest, that, that we would have the highest traffic in June without schools in session, without UMass, without Smith. It's, it's uh, based off of Mass DOT count station. Um, the, the state has access to this, you know, count stations all over the, the, the state, but the Northampton count station, as we identified in the study, um, I, has that as a higher than average month. So. Okay. On the traffic study, it, it just, uh, I'm trying to understand, you say here on the boathouse, it's going to have, between the morning peak hour, 3 in, 1 out, same in the afternoon. We're going to build this project for four vehicles in the morning and four in the afternoon. I mean, it just, it just right. doesn't seem realistic. I mean, why would you do that for? I mean, it seems like there ought to be. If you're going to build this project, there ought to be a lot higher use than that. Yeah. A lot of times, all these boat houses. In, in I mean, that doesn't even fill a boat. We assumed that uh, there would be vans dropping off students, um, which would result in fewer vehicle trips associated with that type of um, user. So the one thing that, that you got to remember is this is a peak hour. I mean, we're looking at one hour of the day. Um, and my understanding is that with these, with these, with a boathouse, you can have it spread out throughout the day or it's going to be earlier in the morning. Typically, that's when you see rowers. They're out there very early. And given the fact that, um, you know, as, as we identified, the morning peak hours between 7.30 and 8.30, we don't see that many trips associated with the boathouse uh, to occur at that hour. So that's why we had a small little representation of that. So you didn't estimate that. You used the land use code out of ID. There is no land use code for a boathouse. Okay. That's, that's a, uh, it's not very common that you do a study for one. You could go out of the boathouse right down at the end of Damon Road and watch all the people drive their own cars, park, and then take their their boats out of the house, their UMass students drive there all the time, so going there to ride my bike, I, I see that a lot. So there's a lot more than three three cars. One thing I should add is, even though this is clearly a public place and people can use it, um, the, given the distance that, that you talked about, this is not a particularly desirable spot for car hopping with boats. We think about heavily, I mean, that's the whole reason for boat house. We think that Canoes and kayaks that are stored there obviously get used there, and canoe shell, I mean, uh, uh, rowing shells will get used there. Car top boats will be allowed, but the Dame Road site is far more attractive because you walk 50 feet instead of 200 feet. And, and it would be prohibited and, there, and, and design blocked from backing in a trailer? Yes. You could walk down. I mean, it, it would be open. Be, you know, there'd be some sort of gates that are hours of operation, but when the site's open, you could carry a boat down, but you couldn't drive it. I'm sure you explained this, but I'm not recalling how the road is working. So if the road that exists now is the private drive, how is access to the to the new site going to be? So the, it, it's a private drive. The land is owned, or the, the first half is owned by River Run, the second half is owned by the next private owner. But there is a shared 30-foot right-of-way. So Mass DOT took, 40 years ago, a 30-foot right-of-way and gave it to lane construction. They basically took off, or whoever owned the property at the time, but they took off Lane's access to North King Street, and they took, by eminent domain, the right to go there. So Lane and that property has the right to go across <coughs> that road. And that's how the city is accessing that, through That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So does the potential exist to, the, the potential is there to uh, increase that 30-foot right of way if River Run allows it to allow sidewalks? That's correct. Is it to, can you further that argument and make it wider still to allow a widening of the road to what it should be or wants to be or to make it better and in a 
addition to a sidewalk, or is it just get, are you restricted to such an extent that? Well, you could. It, first of all, River would have to be willing to do it, giving up their lawn. Right. Second, I mean, we've sort of been moving in the other direction. We're moving to narrower and narrower roads. I, I don't think there's any problem with the width of that road for the volume of cars that we're talking about. So I'm not sure why we need a wider road. It would just make people drive faster. It just sounded like if you're adding that third lane or the potential of the need is for a third lane in the road. Oh, well, that support but that's only, that's only going back 40 feet or 60 feet. Just that well, you're, road, you're just talking, we're just talking about the intersection. Right. Um, just to accommodate queuing. Turning and Correct. And there is land there. That's where, I don't know who owns the property, whether it's lane or whether it's river run. But you see a lane sign that's yeah. now overgrown right this street. So there is room there because it, the, the access road moves away from the interstate a little bit. So that land is available. Again, I don't know who owns it, but land is. Land is there. And so who would maintain the road? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. This is an issue that, from the city standpoint, we need to do more research on. I mean, what, <laughs> What River Run has said is that lanes never paid them a dime for access. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not trying to open up a can of worms, but usually in a share in a right of way, the parties in the right of way have some shared maintenance responsibilities. So that's what we looked into. I mean, if you know, I'm sure if Lane can get a free ride and not pay for anything, they're going to take a free ride. But I wouldn't assume that. I think we need to investigate that. But as the city being a partner in a shared driveway, does that change your thinking? Well, I, mean, I think we should be sharing. I mean, we, we probably wouldn't be sharing the snow because we don't care about the snow because the boathouse is closed in the winter. Um, but in terms of sharing, I mean, it, to me, it's logical that there should be some shared piece of out there. Um, Where the city would do that voluntarily. I'm not sure that River Run is right that they don't have legal mechanism to require some cost share. Um, so that the first question is, is it there? In which case, obviously, we there. And I guess I'm just looking, do they get some shared benefit of of maintenance, what, is there some benefit to them to doing that? Right, right. I mean, that was the, the reason for at least exploring in the beginning, did it make sense for us to be a public road? Because then it's all city. Um, that we've now ruled out, but now it's, that's part of the discussion. And again, we ruled it out, why? Well, River Run didn't seem Doesn't to want to do it, and DPW didn't want to do it. So I guess for those two directions. Mm -hmm. And it would require a lot of waivers. Yeah. Um, Right, so, so the standard medical is not allowed, and I haven't got the exact language, but some of the fact that things, office uses for which retail is a major part, you know, banking is not allowed, things we expect a lot of customers, and obviously salesmen will come in, you might get some uses there, but it's those lower traffic uses. Medical is the big one that's a no-no. So I ought to think industrial park kinds of buildings. Yeah, I mean, lane, lane construction is a good example. You know, their offices are there, obviously salesmen come in, but you probably don't in the middle of the day wander into Lane because you want to buy $2 million of road. Um, so, and Lane is the perfect kind of tenant that's, that's out there. Um, you know, the one you were looking at today, Fazio, at, at State Hospital, that's the sort of tenant who would be allowed here as well. Um, we pitched the site to the Girl Scouts, you know, we're losing from Leeds. We pitched to them saying, well, this would be a great site, it would give you river access. So those kinds of, of uses would all be allowed. But it couldn't be a commercial big box store? Or it couldn't be any retail, retail whatsoever. Or... It couldn't be any office. It could be uh, light industrial is the other kind of use. That's your business park example as well. Those tend to be lower traffic than office. We've used office to give us the worst case scenario from the traffic standpoint. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm board ever came out and said we don't want the city to take over our driveway. Um, what, what we're saying is, you know, we don't want the added traffic. However, we realize that uh, decisions we made and, um, and if, if, uh, if it goes in the direction that we're not in favor of, uh, we certainly want it done in the, in the best way possible. And if taking over the, our driveway uh, 
has to happen. We certainly want to discuss it more fully than just, you know, a casual conversation about it. Um, so I, I don't want people to think that we are adamantly opposed to um, our driveway becoming a street because inevitably the decision is going to be made and we have to live with whatever is made. Um, as you all heard, the traffic is uh, a dynamic problem. To me, this feels a lot like soccer at the Oxbow, which had nothing to do with soccer. It was all about traffic. I haven't heard anybody say either they object to a boathouse by the river or community access to the river. It's all been about traffic, so that's, that's where the concern is. Yep. I'm, I'm Dennis Bidwell. I live back in Forbes Avenue, and I'm the, the, the founder of the Program in the Northampton News and Community Rolling. And I hesitated to say anything because I'm not on the board anymore. But I did just want to add one little piece of history here, if I might. And that is that going back, well, I guess we really got the program going about 14 years ago. But I would, have, I would say for 11 years, there has been a search underway to find a place on the river for a boathouse. Um, Jim Dostal has been involved in this over the years. Jim Dostal and, and, and Wayne and I and Jonathan over the years have looked at, I hesitate to say, I bet 15 to 20 sites going down into Holyoke, going up into Hatfield. We've looked at everything. If you find a site that has a combination of access, utility possibilities, doesn't have wetlands, doesn't have endangered species, doesn't have archaeological issues, the, the, the various hurdles that have to be surmounted. And this is not a perfect site. I don't want to uh, minimize by any means the, the very legitimate issues that we're hearing from the River Run folks. But I'd say there are so few opportunities that come along that I would urge the, the planning board to work with work with uh, the, the planning staff and work with the butters with an attitude of let's do everything we can to try to find a way to make this work because there are just so few, you know, it's a, it's a really unusual opportunity here. And uh, I don't begin to understand quite all the technical challenges that Wayne has been dealing with, and there are significant, significant traffic issues. And I would, as a, as, a, as a person who's been at the boathouse on uh, the Oxbow for many years as a rower and a parent of a rower, I, you're, you're right to question these numbers about uh, the, the, the rowing traffic. Uh, that, you know, the, you can just go down to the, the Oxbow and get a, a good handle on what it would be. It's not huge, but it's more than one car, three cars. But in any event, I'm not here to quibble with that. I'm here to say that I think there's a really significant opportunity here. And it's worth it's worth really working hard to try to come up with solutions. So that's my, that's my suggestion. So we need to uh, like a move that we continue this meeting until our seven point additional person on October eleventh. sort of unraveled and the Board of Public Works has discovered that there are many such streets <laughs> and there have been 
accepted. So as soon as this article was in the paper about Hillcrest and they, the residents along Hillcrest said, wait a second, yeah, snow's coming. We don't want to be caught up in this because the issue is that DPW shouldn't be maintaining streets that aren't officially accepted publicly. So based on a recommendation from the city solicitor and um, DPW, um, there was a recommendation that the ones, the streets that we have, for which we have reported sub subdivision boundaries, we have pins, we have all the, the uh, layouts reported in the registry, those are going to be simple to move through the process and that if they come through petition, then city council should consider those quickly. There are other ones that are going to take lots of deep research because we have no survey work, we have nothing. And that means the city's going to have to spend money to get the survey. Board of Public Works has to pick up the process for those other difficult streets. Hillcrest, we have all the reported survey information, so we can get any things that's a pretty straightforward thing. So the, is it officially, when a street acceptance request comes forward, it's you have to have six petitioners or residents of the city, sign a petition to send to city council. It gets referred to planning board for a recommendation and also board of public works for a recommendation. Then it goes back to city council for um, a yay or nay. So, in front of you, our, uh, I mean, um, staff recommendation, in, in a word, is to, to um, that you all go to recommend it to city council. Everything is sort of in place. And, you know, the practice in the 1960s. It doesn't, except I just wonder how it looks. I mean, this is a this is going to be seen as a fairness issue across the city as to which streets get taken in to the public till and which ones don't. I mean, I, I agree. This one, it, it's a practicality which ones can we accept. But then I think if you take those and you divide them into those we can and those we need to work on, they're going to have characteristics that apply to where they are in the population they serve. I agree. I, I was thinking also talking to Carolyn that the reason Hillcrest is no brainer, we have all that information, we have everything, all the legwork has been done. And so the DPW, if they were going to make a stance, well, we need more information. So in the meantime, uh, while we're doing due diligence, we, it's not our road, we're not going to follow. In this instance, we have the information, vote on it, that's fine. But for those roads, roads that are as legitimate as Hillcrest are, but that information isn't available yet, how long is it going to take to get that information? And if in the meantime, DPW says, oh, because of legal reasons, we're not going to file this year, then it's going to be a mess. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm not opposing getting it through. I just think it's 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 starting something that it, and it indicates you tip your hand as soon as you do the, the one and say why. Right. Well, what's your point? Well, again, and you know, it goes back to city council. It's not really you necessarily. Right. City council is the one that's going to have to make that hard choice. Are we going to move one forward and not the other? Or are we going to hurry up and, ex and distribute well, funds? And Brandy called my hand. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we should, we could, you know, I mean, I, I feel I could go on record saying that we should approve everyone that comes before us. But, you know, unless there's some particular reason that we can. But people are paying taxes. They deserve to the streets from. But the well, street there has are, to meet certain standards. Right. And there are certain streets before you make a blanket statement know that there are some of those that were advertised in the newspaper as subdivisions that you guys approved, but they're not quite ready. And they haven't they haven't been completed yet. Yep. So Gumpy Drive, for example, they haven't the very the cul de sac that was created just seven years ago. They never, that project never fully came to, to its end. So that's well, I mean, anyone that meets, but. meets it, certainly the recent ones that we approved for subdivision, um, I would recommend accepting the public street as soon as they technically can be. And one that, if Hillcrest can be approved, and that's the only one that can be approved, we should approve it. There's no way to use, you know, a principal presumptive eligibility. I mean, that, you know, that they will get there. I mean, instead of saying that they have to prove that they're a street, can't we 
presume that they are street and then let the proof come afterwards? I mean, well, it seems like that would be a more fair approach than saying some are going to get it, some aren't, even though they're taxpaying citizens that live on the street. I mean, is there any way to do it that way? To approve, uh, assume the positive as opposed to the negative. <laughs> Or at least keep filing in the meantime. Or at least, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's again, it's not, not part of the no, planning board. Right. And, and right. in fact, the street exception comes, to, you guys have 45 days to act, and if you don't act within 45 days, city council can, you know, brush whatever was supposed to happen. I think we aside. recommend the city council acceptance of Hill, Hillcrest <laughs> as a public street, public we'll way. All in favor? <laughs> I'm sorry to you started yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I started it and now I have to stop it. Okay. So we'll next again in two weeks we're not we there are no permits, so we'll we can talk about the forums. Um, those beautiful tables. I move we adjourn. All in favor? Five minutes and so much promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, just you are fooling me.